Okay, we have another episode. Uh, if I feel, you know, if I sound groggy or shitty, it's because I have COVID. Or one of our, you know, other other hosts here, Marcus, also has COVID right now. So if I stop mid sentence and I become silent because I'm coughing and turn my mic off. So um, I hope everybody out there stays safe. Uh, it's th- it's not a good feeling to get COVID, and it, you know I hope you know just just be safe. So. Um, we're all going to introduce ourselves as if we were all guests and I pretty much we're all hosts in this episode because this is going to be shared in another podcast as well. So I guess I'll start first. Uh, my name is Rick. I'm one of the hosts on this podcast, Decon- Decolonized Buffalo. I am Comanche. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Comanche Nation and uh, I'm also on my mom's side. I'm also Rara Moody and uh, we, I was born in Mexico. Uh, and I lived in the U.S. as undocumented for a little bit, and then with a green card, I eventually became a citizen. Um, and I have a Indigenous Peoples Law degree from OU. And you guys can uh, go. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, Rick. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you for having Juanchelo and I on um, your channel. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, my name is Marcus. I am the co-host of the Indigenous Podcast. Um, a little bit about me real quick. Uh, I was adopted from Peru. Um, I've lived in the United States most of my life. I started the Indigenous podcast um, because, you know, I I didn't see myself as the uh, typical, you know, Hispanic Latino uh, identity that I, you know, always thought the United States government wanted to put upon us. Um, So recently I went into this movement of uh, identifying as Native American and Indigenous um, but yeah, that's pretty much a little short spiel for me. Thank you. Uh, hey, I'm um, Wanchaloa and, uh, Rick, uh, thank you for having us on, man. And I uh, hope you to recover from COVID quickly. I know it can be really bad. Uh, my, uh, dad got, uh, COVID in September and he was in the hospital for two weeks. So it can be really serious. So I hope you guys pull through rather quickly. Uh, so I was born in Mexico and I was brought to the U S when I was about three or four years old. And I grew up and documented until I was 15. Then I entered the legal process and I recently became a citizen uh, December 8th is when I became a citizen of the U.S. And uh, I reconnected with uh, my indigenous community in San Luis Potosí, the Guachichil, after doing a lot, a lot of research, um, probably over 800 hours and talking to family members, interviewing them uh, and just putting in a lot of work. And I'm a co-host of Indigenous Podcast. You know, start, we, me and Marcus met online like a over a year ago and we had a lot of the same views and uh, we started the podcast. Uh, Our views has evolved over time. It's changed and they're always open to change. If we figure out that we're wrong, wrong on certain points, Uh, you know, we switched positions on some things. So thank you for having us on again. Yeah. That's the thing with uh, life. You know, we have to be open to change. Somebody recently contacted me. And I, they noticed I said stuff about um, this community, not like a bad in a bad way, but I, it got brought up so much that they want to come on and you know and bring episodes about uh, correcting. And I'm open. I said, you know, like to this person, hey man, like, um, you know, like I, I'm not free from being corrected, and it's fine, you know. You know, at the same time, um, since I, since I can remember starting this podcast, I have said like, hey, you know, if anybody wants to bring an opposing view, I'm fine. As long as you're not bringing like why capitalism is good or why fucking America rocks, right? <laughs> so, so I think you know, <laughs> it's one of those things that I, I'm okay listening to. I mean, even like anarchists, I, I'm not, I don't like the theory, but you know, I, I'm willing to hear it. It's, you know, it's decolonial. Um, so, you know, uh, I think we started talking you know, me and, you know, Juan and Marcus, <clears throat> because um, backstory for, for those just that are listening, uh, I got like a death threat last, late last year. And um, they, you know, both these uh, Juan and Marcus uh, hosts have contacted me and they were like, you know, giving me support or, you know, saying, hey, we support you, that's wrong. And, you know, that was just like a, a, a snowball effect from like, like online beef, right? And I, I, had, I said this before in, the, in other podcasts, my slippery slope thing, how people, 
you know, they they use, you know, like cancel culture or slander to silence people or to like, um, um, you know, stop the conversation. I, you know, and I, and I think, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people say something online and there's somebody that takes it too far, you know, and I think, you know, uh, you know, us and, and you know, you, me, me and, you know, Juan and Marcus were going back and forth. And I, I, you know, you know, it was a little bit angry, but, you know, I think online beef is stupid. And I think, you know, most of my haters that come towards the podcast, usually can't, it comes from one person. Is one person that's like stalking me, and I have a stalker, you know, and is is getting the online community with like sl false slander, and, and I keep seeing screenshots, people sending me stuff, and I'm just like, why doesn't this person just talk to me? You know what I'm saying? Why? Why? And so you know, right now we, you know, after you know when we start talking, Juan and, and Marcus and I, we start seeing that you know we can have conversations uh, about indigeneity without bickering, without you know dumb shit. So you guys, you guys have thoughts? Yeah, of course. So I think, um, I think it's really easy to read into just comments or text online, right? You know, because people will put um, an aggressive tone sometimes with people that, um, you know, they'll, they'll criticize them, right? And so then, you know, you read into things, you get angry, and it just escalates over time. And honestly, what we should have done is just have talked to each other, like on a zoom or or something like way sooner and none of that would have happened. And that's why I encourage people to do to, you know, if you're really getting into some serious beef, it's like, I think, and it's always been through just text, you know, just uh, posts and stuff. It's like, you're probably misunderstanding each other or, you know, it takes away so much of the human element that it's so easy to just escalate and it should have never gotten to, you know, having beef between, between us. And I'm glad that we did reach out to you in October because I, I thought it was completely unacceptable that you got, death threats that's uh well i mean that's first of all that's criminal whoever sent that should be prosecuted but yeah i just it should have never gotten to that point and i'm glad that we're sitting here and i hope this video can serve as an example to other people that hey you know even if we have differing views on a lot of things we can sit down we can be civil and, and we can you know have discussions so you know um for my part i you know we, we did tell you back in october you know we do apologize for the beef you know i I, I apologize it got escalated, but uh, I'm glad that we're here now. Yeah, I think we both we both apologize to each other. I I apologize to you on my end too. So I mean, I'm not, I wasn't you know innocent of you know the online back and forth. Um, you know, and I, I I stuff that I haven't I haven't really shared. You know, you know, I, I've been you know with, you know, uh, it's just hard. You know, this last year has been hard. My wife's sister is sick from cancer and we you know we've been trying to help out and um it's just been you know financially really rough on all the whole family because we're all you know chipping in you know how the the, the medical system is and she's in mexico but still it's, it's fucked up and it's it's just been real shitty so i think um i would like to address some things because especially since you know right before we this last week before we, you know, we, you know, right now recording, um, I saw a meme uh, and I sent it to you guys that said that it was like that party meme was like, oh, I don't know. These people don't know. And, you know, the people are dancing are like, yeah, we do know. Right. A stupid, you know, meme. And it was like that I support blood quantum, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. It's just like people, I mean, if you heard that this podcast, you, anybody would know that I'm like anti blood quantum, you know? Um, yeah, me, me and Marcus knew that like from, I don't know, from over a year ago, we, we, we always knew that. I don't know what, why people are, they're just going to invent anything at this point. Like, this is silly. Yeah. So, you know, there's like, you know, really, you know, going through them real quick, like, and I grew up Chicano. Uh, then I learned I was native. I kind of rolled. Then I turned back to Chicano. That's a really odd, very specific <laughs> uh, rumor about me. Uh, I will say that I, I never grew up Chicano. Um, I first I was born in Mexico. I think I don't think Mexicans born in Mexico could be considered Chicano, right? No, I I, I would say you're just Mexican at that point, you know. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, um, I've always known I was native, and yeah, I have family issues that 
you know, my story about, I, I said this before in the podcast, I got enrolled, you know, right early 20s. Uh, and that was because of family issue. And I wasn't the only one in my family that got enrolled when I did. It was other people too. And it was family issues. And it's, you know, it was really like nobody's business, really, you know. And I think, you know, people to take my story and twist it to like, I don't know or whatever I didn't know. It's just weird shit, you know. Um, I just, I... You know, I think people people also try to use anything to silence the conversation. Like, for, for example, like the blood quantum thing, I'm pro blood quantum when I'm not. Or they'll say something like, oh, he's Northern native. But I'm like, you know, my mom's side, I'm native from Mexico too. So, and I was, like I said, born in Mexico. I, I lived undocumented. And it's, it's not an easy life, you know? And I think, you know, people will, will throw anything, you know, against the wall to make sure, see if it sticks so they can like silence the opposition. I think it's kind of weird that a lot of the stuff that I say, people come and tap me, but like people tell me like, oh, this person is saying the same shit you are. And it's like months later. So it's like, why attack me? Why not apologize for your actions, you know, for your posts about this podcast when they're clearly false, right? And I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the culture of like being aggressive, but, you know, I don't see how, you know, being traditional or being, you know, like, uh, native you know it, it, you know being like some online bullies part of being native it, what kind of you know that's not that's not i don't know i don't know usually the, the people that are the biggest like I'm, I'm the most traditional are usually like you know like uh bullies online too and it's just like why you know uh so i don't you, you guys have dots before i move on I, I would just say probably i think some of the aggression just could just come in the sense of like people, I would say they would know you're, they thought you were Mexican American, right? So I think that probably uh, caused some of it. And then the whole, we have a saying, and I'm sure you're familiar with it with their own people. Like, you know, it's just that Mexican phenomenon of like, you know, a Mexican makes it and, you know, he basically kicks the ladder away from the rest of them. Or, you know, your greatest enemy is another Mexican. I think it goes into that type of mentality. That's another reason why you've had some of that aggression, even though it's been unwarranted. Yeah. I just, uh, I think even you guys got some stuff too. And I don't know if you guys want to share it. You know, it's up to you. I don't, I don't you know, I'm not trying to pressure you. Uh, but I think, you know, if I would advise if somebody comes up to you with like rumors or slander on somebody, you should probably verify it before you repost it. Right. Uh, I've seen a lot of crazy rumors on about people that I was just like, I don't know about that. And, uh, and I, I don't understand that culture. I don't understand online culture. You know, I, I try to stay away from it. I try to be less, you know, uh, not too, not cloudy. I'm not trying to push, put my pictures everywhere and say, Hey, look where I'm at right now. Look what I'm driving. Look what I'm eating. Like when it comes to our, you know, uh, the podcast, social medias, like I, I think, at most, you can hear my voice and hear my opinion on stuff, and that's what matters, you know. Or, yeah. And the voices of the guests, not you know how like, you know how, what, how am I doing with materialism or you know like capital, you know or clout, you know. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not for that. I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah, I was telling Wanchalo the other day where um, some person decided to create a YouTube account with uh, my face and then start commenting. And there was this live video that was going on and, you know, this person was commenting and I saw that and, you know, I just kind of just ignored it. And I was just like, all right, we'll just see what happens. And literally like the next day, this person, um, you know, trying to in their attempts to, I wouldn't say dox me, but just like try to embarrass me, uh, caused our sub count to go up by 10 subscribers. So I was just like, okay, just continue to like do that. Like it's just go on, keep on making our channel more famous. And so I just thought it was funny, like people's attempts and trying to make you look bad. Um, in reality, they're improving your channel. I think that's weird because I, I had that too. And, and so I'm sure you, got, you guys saw it too. Uh, somebody made a YouTube channel and they named it Decolonized Bison, right? And they were commenting on your guys' stuff. And I was like, bro, you're stupid as fuck. Who, the fu who thinks that's really me? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. yeah no I, we, we we it was uh we could obviously see it was just some stupid parody account they're just being uh stupid as fuck but 
I was going to say, um, yeah, Mar- Mark is like, uh, he lets a lot of that stuff slide, uh, slide off of him. Uh, I have struggled a little bit because I have been uh, attacked like, uh, well, within the last two or three months, I was attacked quite viciously about like my weight and my looks and this and that. So, it, you know, I, I can certainly see how it's just, you know, it, it accumulates over time and it just, you know, it just, it weighs heavily on you. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot there was one thing I was going to mention. Yeah, we definitely do get some hate from like certain, well, not a whole lot, I would say. I think recently it's like died down, but just like people, um, you know, certain groups of people that really disagree with like what we have to say. And they'll say oh, that yeah. we're like, you know, uh, mestizos or just go ahead and say something that's like they, they oh, think is going to like really emotionally, you know, damage us. But like... Yeah, the Hispanistas really don't like us either. But yeah, that's another group of people that'll attack us quite, quite, uh, quite a lot. I was gonna say, oh, okay, yeah. So the, here's another thing, uh, Rick, which I think I'm starting to kind of understand, like a little bit of your own pain in the sense that uh, with a lot of our views, like me and Marcus have seen problems, and we'll, we'll get into this more in the conversation. But some problems with, um, you know people reconnecting right and some of the actions they take which we'll get more into but because we've called these things out and because we ha- we say this, these are the steps you should take with respect uh people started calling me and marcus gatekeepers and we're we're big we're big and bad and we're mean and all this other stuff so i've, I've started to understand how you feel like somewhat on that yeah we can talk about it. we start right now i think the point of this uh the other second section of this uh recording is uh, to talk about uh, the detribalized because, you know, I have been uh, cautious of these, uh, well, Chicanismo, I talk about Chicanismo a lot, right? And we, we, we'll discuss why I talk about Chicanismo. And, um, but, you know, this term detribalized is a new term within like the last, I would say, uh, three, four years, right? And since I've been talking about Chicanismo and race shifting within the Mexican population and, you know, in, Ch- in Chicano academia, um, I, I noticed that things change. So back in the early 2000s, uh, I would talk about uh, sovereignty, right? Native sovereignty. And uh, a lot of Chicanos did not understand what I was saying. So they would say stuff like, that's white people shit, or sovereignty is white people shit. And now, now everybody's fucking talking about sovereignty, right? So it's fucking, it's, you know, like, but they're saying it in the wrong way. So we, we'll, t- we'll start with the first question. Um, oh, for, for, because everybody has different definitions. I think we need to, we need to like uh, uh, establish a definition, right? I think so. When it comes to detribalize, de- a detribalized person, what does detribalize mean to you? Everybody has their own definition. All right, so uh, I'll start. I'm gonna reference uh, actually a Mexican anthropologist, pretty distinguished guy named Guillermo Batalla. He has a book called uh, Mexico Profundo. And so he calls it de-Indianization. So this was written back in like 1980s, 1970s. And I would say this is probably the best definition I can use to explain. So <clears throat> de-Indianization or detribalization is a historical process through which populations that originally possessed a particular or distinctive identity based upon their own culture are forced to renounce that identity with all the consequent changes in their social organization and culture. De-Indianization is not the result of biological mixture, but of the pressure of an ethnocide that ultimately blocks the historical continuity of a people as a culturally differentiated group. So. I, what I would say is just people that are descendants of natives that were assimilated into the, into the colonial order. Marcus, do you have? I'd also like to. Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, okay. I'd also like to add on to that is that you know they are um, you know the Indianization uh, was like the ethnocide of indigenous people, so it's now you know clear descendants that are trying to regain the identity that was you know stolen from them for so long um through methods of colonization um from uh, you know uh, spaniards and other 
authorities throughout the uh, South American, Central American colonial timeline that no longer wish to live in the, uh, I, I guess I would say, colonial parameters that have been set up by them. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I um, yeah. when it comes to detribalized, I have said, and you know, in, in very early episodes in this podcast, that you know, I, I said that I, I, you know, there's like federally recognized tribes, state recognized tribes, um, and um, that I said that there's like people that have been stripped from uh, their indigeneity. And it's a part of a scar, a colonization, right? Uh, if, if people really have heard the podcast, they would know what the, that I, I acknowledge this. There are people that have, that they're probably native, but they don't know, right? And um, that's part of colonization. You know, colonization has destroyed or, or tried to erase, you know, in some instance, you know, um, some culture, some languages, you know, some histories. And I think uh, that sucks. You know, I would I would say that I don't think somebody that knows that they're native and they're connecting, I don't consider that uh, as a detribalized because they they know their community. So if you know your community, in my point of view, you're, it doesn't matter how much you know and how much you don't know, as long as you you're part of that community, you're not detribalized. In my point of view, right? Because um, it's everybody's responsibility, you know, as an individual to, to do the work of learning your own culture, you know, languages, you know, being part of the community, you know, being accountable to the community. So, uh, so if somebody, you know, is listening, so if they, if you, if they, if these people know, I don't consider that detribalized. Um, but there is a concern, you know, the next question is uh, who can claim um, as detribalized because this this is coming up it's like a wave right of, of people that are coming up and saying these things so like you know the questions are who can claim indigeneity you know can somebody claim indigeneity based on phenotypes alone can someone that has been detached from indigenous community claim indigeneity if so how long is acceptable for example okay the, we won't, we won't go to that question. So let's go on phenotypes first and who can claim it. So you, you guys can go first. All right. So uh, when it comes to this question, I see quite a bit of a clash uh, with people that have, uh, it's just a difference in definitions really and how we understand it. So the way me and Marcus and a lot of people on our side have used this is we use um, Amerindian, Indigenous, Native American, all as a racial category. And so to us, just how any other racial group is a member of a racial group based off phenotype, it, the same thing would apply in this case, because I mean, Amber Indian is a separate racial group from the others. That clashes with people that their definition is you have to have a traditional community and a, have the culture and those things, right? So they tie ethnicity into it as part of the requirement to be Amber Indian. So that's, so that's where the clash really comes in is because we're both looking at it from different worldviews, essentially, on, on what it means, on what this means, right? Marcus, do you want to chime in? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that, you know, it is, I will agree with you that it is kind of a slippery slope and you know, looking at it from two different directions. But in terms of like discussing phenotype, I think that it kind of goes in some ways for my case, for example, you know, I was adopted, um, you know, I don't want to like talk about phenotypes too much, but that's, you know, having this, you know, identity in this physical, um, I don't know, how would I say this, this physical identity of knowing that I'm indigenous, that is all I have, you know, I don't have connections to biological family members at all. Um, so people can say like I cling on to that, but I believe that because I mean that I am indigenous, particularly to the Andean world in Peru. Um, I don't 
see why someone else, I will say, uh, someone would op oppose that. I mean, because I, I can't connect to my community. Um, and I don't, and I think the other thing that I would like to say is that for those other people that are also in my position, that also uh, maybe it's impossible for them to connect to the community. Um, you know, they're doing their part in in reconnecting in some other way, rather if that's, you know, supporting indigenous communities online, um, you know, joining, you know, indigenous social groups, working with those that are in indigenous communities, for example, oh, I won't name names, but, you know, other people that we have had on our, our channel, we've talked with that have supported um, us, you know, for Wanchalo, it's a little bit of a different story because, you know, thankfully for him, he's connected to um, indigenous community. But if in my case that, uh, you know, phenotypes um, looking how I am is all I have. Um, and, and I think I like to speak for a majority of those that are in our, that follow our podcast, that we have no intentions of taking any sort of benefit that I think some people that have opposed us might fear that we would want to do. Um, we simply just want our identity, you know, recognized. Um, but yeah, well, I hope that, I hope that explains it in some way. We're going to yeah, say much low. Yeah. And we, we've said on our podcast, like we have a, a no benefits position when we, when we talk about like people uh, racially saying that they're native, because I mean, you know, genetically, that's what they are. That's what they are physically. Uh, and you know, these people here in the U S especially you suffer because of that. Um, but when we talk about this, we, we've always say that if you're the tribalized, you wouldn't be going around and applying for native scholarships or native benefits that are meant for traditional indigenous communities. The same thing would apply if you were in Mexico. It's like, it's, it's just, you're socially identifying with your ancestry, with what you physically are. That that's what, that's all it boils down to. It's not about taking benefits or taking land or doing any of these things. And we condemn people that state these things because we, we've had, we've called some people out that, that say that the tribal people should just apply for all these uh, traditionally indigenous benefits. And this is like, no, because you're not traditionally indigenous. It's not meant for you. You know, it's meant for those that do have a community because they are way more marginalized and they are more oppressed. And especially in Mexico, because you have people that, uh, you know, a large segment of the population is physically Amerindian and DNA studies have shown this both with uh, scientific journals like BMC Evolutionary Bio Biology. Uh, they've stated this. And by the Annals of Human Genetics, usually when it comes to Mexicans, they average 30 to 46% uh, Amerindian DNA. So a lot of them are physically natives, right? But they have contributed to the oppression of the traditional indigenous people in Mexico. So th that's why... It's just a hard. It's just a hard topic, and it's very complicated, right? But uh, we think that the solution is for people to turn back to their indigenous identity if they are clearly indigenous, uh, physically speaking, and to put that at the forefront. Because the reason why Mexico has been so oppressive to tra traditional indigenous communities is this whole notion of, well, I'm mixed with a little bit of European. I'm a little white, and so therefore I'm superior. It's that whole mestizaje ideology, the whole Vas Jose Vasconcelos ideology that's led to this oppression. And that's, that, that's the disease, if you will, right? The symptoms is the oppression. So that's what me and Marcus believe in, is in erasing that, erasing that whole notion of you're superior because you're, you got a little bit of white admixture. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we, there's a lot of, um, stuff covered and some of the questions we ask again are you know in the future right now are going to be touched by that i don't even know, i don't even know how to answer to this because you guys cover so much i don't know you know what to touch exactly but i'm going to do the best like as i can right um i think uh and i you know i've said this you know many times I, i'm against dna tests 100 percent and uh, there's reasons for that. There's like, you know, for example, there was a dude that swabbed his dog's mouth in Canada and it came back to be like something stupid, like 12% indigenous. You know, how, can you, how can you trust that fucking test in my point of view? But at the same time, you know, uh, there has been a history of settlers uh, pretending to be indigenous for the benefits 
of for for resources, you know, and this is you know, especially in the U.S. since you know our our you know our colonization was done through treaties, you know, like what the legally the legal way, unlike Mexico, you know, it was done through military force, you know, and religion. So it was you know same with the U.S., but you know we had treaties here that enforced our sovereignty, you know, um, and I think you know with the racial classification. That's, in my point of view, that's also very like Eurocentric, a little bit, you know, uh, point of view, uh, you know, like race is a, is a construct that, you know, white people have used to divide, you know, going back, you know, for the longest time, um, uh, you know, colonizations of, of the world, like, oh, like these people here are a different race, let's colonize them, oh, you know, uh, these these, you know, you know, the Christians, you know, trying to, uh, you know, like uh, their, their, their quest against the Muslims, you know, and they're like, all oh, these are, these people are Arabs and they're, you know, they're darker. It's all, you know, it's, it's this weird fascination these people have with eugenics and, and DNA and, 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 and you know, race. Um, but, you know, when it comes to indigeneity, if people don't know, okay, so I've heard a lot of people say, I don't know I'm indigenous, but I know I'm indigenous because I'm brown and I'm from Mexico, right? And I'm only talking about Mexico. I'm not talking about South America. Like to me, or even Central America, right? I'm, I'm strictly talking about Mexico because of the policies Mexico had. And we'll talk about like mestizaje, which I hate, right? Um, so, you know, in Mexico, we were talking about this a little bit before the podcast, before the recording. Uh, this, this episode. Uh, so you have to go backwards in time, okay? Uh, we're going to go back all the way to, uh, you know, 11 AD when the, the Arabs were, the, you know, with the Berbers, uh, they took over, you know, Spain, you know, and, and eventually, you know, it took the Christians 800 years, almost 800 years to the, the Reconquista of Spain so that, you know, the, the, the Christians took over Spain. And so for 800 years, you know, Arabs and Jewish people, and Jewish people were there even before that, you know, were, you know, uh, you know, they were in Spain mixing together, you know, mixing, mixing, mixing you know, uh, families, you know, having relationships from different communities. Um, and, and, you know, <clears throat> Marcus brought up, uh, he heard a podcast episode when I talk about uh, when I was in Afghanistan, and part of my chain of command was from Spain. And those dudes were as dark as me, right? And I, we talked about that, you know, and, and they acknowledged that they have, you know, Arab blood or, you know, like, you know, ancestry that's not white, you know? And even, even, even the conversation of, of whiteness is kind of weird. Like, why are we censoring whiteness, right? Why are we so obsessed with like, you know, who's white and who's not? And, and, and or, you know, the privileged thing, but that's a whole different conversation. I'm going to push this aside real quick. Um, but, you know, these people, I acknowledge they had, you know, like ancestry from, you know, Africa or the Middle East, you know, and, and so, you know, when the, the, when the Muslims got, uh, you know, they got pushed out of Spain, uh, it was at 1491. That date... <laughs> It's the same date of contact, right, of, of the Spanish into the Americas. So, you know, uh, when, when people came from Spain, it wasn't just white people. It was a mixture of, of people from Spain that had different ancestry, right? And a lot of people, you know, um, uh, they would convert because it's either like, leave or convert and people can convert to Christianity. So a lot of these people that were brown stayed, you know, and I, you know, and some of them obviously helped the, 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 the mission for, for Spain to colonize. And that, you know, they helped, they went to Mexico and, you know, some of them are brown. When I was uh, in, in Dubai, um, I, some people spoke to me, in, you know, in Arabic, you know, and I was like, I'm not. And they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, but does it make me Arabic, right? Because they thought I, I was, you know, a local and I wasn't, 
So, you know, it's, it, you know, we base something just on phenotype. It's really tricky. You know, we also have to have the conversation of black history uh, in Mexico, which, you know, uh, forced black uh, uh, um, labor was brought into Mexico, just like the US, as much as the US was brought into Mexico. So, you know, um, you know, um, so people with, with, you know, that are not white, you know, they could get their pigmentation from anywhere, from, you know, black forced labor, from, you know, people from Spain that were, you know, had uh, Arab ancestry. And it's really tricky because, uh, you know, and then there was also uh, the, the migration into Mexico from Asia in, in, in the, um, uh, 1500s. So, you know, it's all this mixture, you know, of, of like, uh, of Mexico and Mexico itself, you know, it's just, you know, it's a settler state. And, you know, it just like, you know, Juan said it, you know, its agenda was to colonize, right? It's a, it's a settler state. So we have a situation where communities just like in the US, just like in Canada and everywhere else in, you know, in the Americas have been colonized. Some communities are completely gone. Some are here, right? And we're, they're still intact, they still have their languages, they still have their culture, they still have their, um, you know, uh, their history. And some, some people acknowledge that they, they, they exist, that they could be indigenous, but they just don't know. But the thing is like, for me, I, you know, I think we have to have the conversation of, of you know, sovereignty with the, with the communities that exist now. What that sovereignty looks like is up to those communities, you know? And um, I, I have said before, you know, I, my, um, I have family members from Mexico that speak, you know, uh, indigenous language. And I, I plan to, you know, take my recording stuff and record their stories, you know, uh, they live here in the U S and, uh, and, but, you know, if I were to go to those communities and I said, Hey, I'm so-and-so would the community accept me? I don't know. It's up to that community, but my, my family members have ties to that community and they, they know who I am. So it's, it's like that. Like, is does your community know you, you know, it's just, just like Comanches, right? There's people that are, don't have enough blood quantum, but are considered they're still, they're still considered Comanche, right? So uh, that's that's you know um, that's the thing, and it's, and then at the same time there was there's like, you know tribal members that are very like pro blood quantum for some reason, and they push like oh a Comanche should be half or Comanche should be quarter, and it's just like why, right? When Comanches themselves, it's not it's not like uh, we're not like pure blood, quote unquote, we, we, we uh, you know, we braided a lot of people, we assimilated a lot of people into our community. So there's no such thing as my point of view, and I'll say this publicly, there's no such thing as a full blood Comanche in my point of view, right? Impossible. And, um, and but that's the thing, it, we're a community, and, you know, we have a history and I think, you know, people that Comanche that understand our history know that, you know, uh, acknowledge our history and I think you know, when, when it comes to communities, is we have to acknowledge that when it comes to decolonization, when it comes to talk of sovereignty, and sovereignty itself is the conversation we'll have later in the podcast, is that we need to make sure in order to destroy settler colonization, we need to have, we need to, you know, help indigenous communities with their sovereignty. But, you know, at the same time, we have to acknowledge there's people that are exploiting indigeneity for their personal gain. Right. And yeah, you know, like there's nothing more that any native person wants than having somebody come home and finding out who they are. But we have to be really careful, man. And I, I suggest people reading to read Becoming Indian by Cersei Sturm. And I just started reading that this week. Um, and a lot of the stuff, I'm not even done reading it, but a lot of the stuff that she brings up, I see it within like the Mexican uh, community or the Chicano community. I'm like, there's a lot of crossovers from the type of ex exploitation, you know, and fake tribes and fake, you know, people faking to be indigenous. 
like I said, there's a history of settler colonization of people faking to be native. So we have to be really careful about who claims to be indigenous. On phenotype, in my point of view, that's not enough. You know, and people should people should research their families. They should research their their you know their um you know where they came from you know and and even that's a conversation that's like you know that's kind of tricky too. So we, we have to be really careful that you know people that you know think maybe they're indigenous that they're not speaking over people from indigenous communities that exist you know that they're you know are, are here. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts, but oh, you want to move to the next question. So. No, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. So uh, that last point where you said about speaking over indigenous voices, uh, I, I completely agree. The, I don't want people to be doing that. And I can see that being a problem. We had a guest. Um, I won't name his name uh, because I didn't ask permission. But, you know, I had an indigenous guest, uh, Northern Native on, on our podcast, and he stated how in the past, uh, you know, the recent past year, uh, you've had people that are, you know, quote unquote, reconnecting or tribalized, and they'll go to protests and they'll do their own shit when when it's not even about them. It's about a specific tribal community. And that's absolutely disgraceful. Like that, that is speaking over. That's actually getting in the way, you know, just because I, I guess they go there and do their own shit just because they have a self uh, self-importance, a sense of self-importance. Right. And it's like that's completely unethical. So, so I, I completely condemn that, you know, people, if, if they are reconnecting and they want to help indigenous people, they need to listen and they need to fall in line and uh, ask how they can help. They're not the ones taking the lead on how, on what they're going to do. That's, that's nonsensical. So yeah, I completely, I completely agree on that point. Um, and I, I agree that there, there are concerns like with reconnecting natives doing wrongs because I've seen this before where, and we, we and Marcus have condemned this on the podcast, where people, uh, which this will get into more of the next question, but you can't just, um, just because you're detribalized doesn't mean that you can just um, up and claim whatever ethnic group and not even be a member, not even have to talk to any of that. You, you can't just be going around claiming that you're from a tribe when you're not, right? So that, that's, that's, a, that's a concern I've seen. And um, I was going to say, as far as the history of Mexico with the immigration with a lot of and you know with slavery and all that um yes that is certainly true and it's backed by the genealogy i've done i've i found that i've come from many uh african ancestors <laughs> and um yeah the spanish the spaniards themselves were were uh, a mix as well not not all of them there's quite a bit of white people um i know that you've talked to some spaniards from the military uh when you were serving in afghanistan uh, but I've also had international students from Spain and they were very white. And I talked to one of them and she, when I asked her, I was like, well, can you, uh, like, what is Spain like? She did tell me, she's like, everybody in Spain is white. Now, obviously that has to be an exaggeration, not everybody that's impossible, but from her point of view, she was a white Spaniard and she was saying most of them were white people, but that's what she had to say on that. Um, but yes, the, the, there's other racial groups in Mexico that, I mean, 2% of the population is African from their 2020 census. And you did have uh, the slavery admixture. You did have Asians coming to Mexico. But the core population of Mexico was indigenous peoples, and they mixed out or you know, with different people. So a lot of people, and this is backed by a lot of the MT DNA studies, uh, their, their um, mother's line, you know, is indigenous about 90% of the population. Uh, but that doesn't mean 90% of the population is indigenous, no. Again, it's about, uh, on average, it's 30 to 46%. Every single person has that much admixture from natives because they were the core population and they just got mixed. So more often than not, I'm just going to say, if a person has the phenotype, it's probably due to that ancestry because again, most of the population in Mexico was from indigenous people and eventually they were mixed with Europeans or they were mixed with another group. And while, while there was African admixture and Asian admixture and all these people, um, they, you know, that would get mixed out over generations because I mean, I have plenty of African ancestors, but I'm far from it being an African American or, or looking African in any sense, just because that's not really the core of what is, uh, I'm physically made up of. So, you know, just a couple of things I wanted to point out there, as far as the 
DNA testing. I, I wanted to look into this because I was like, how could a DNA testing company mess up a dog, <laughs> you know, and say that they're indigenous. But I looked into it um, and th- there's two companies that did this. One was called Laboratory Via Guard Acumetrics and one was called Origin. And so w- with uh, Via Guard, it seems that the problem was that they were just a scam company in the sense that they weren't even running a credible lab. They were just giving whatever estimates. So they were just stealing people's money and spitting out an estimate. And um, Origin, it was the same. It was the same case. They, these, these were not credible companies. These, these were scam companies. Another company that is stated to be not very accurate to kind of scamish is CRI Genetics. I'm going to throw that one out there. But uh, there are, you know, just because some of them are scam companies doesn't mean that they're all scam companies. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe are endorsed by professional genealogists. They're very accurate as far as the reference panels and databases. So I did want to point that out um, as far as going into this conversation. Marks, do you have anything? Yeah, uh, and I just wanted to also add that we've also made uh, some videos. So while I made one about like for those that you know, quote unquote, you know, tribalized natives, as we say, um, not to appropriate and <clears throat> take on you know communities, uh, you know, identity that's clearly not theirs. Um, that's very bad for the community already residing here. Um, in you know United States, Canada, whatnot, um, and we've also called out others that have um, been accused of um, appropriating an identity. That being the woman from Canada, I believe I forgot her name. Um, you remember what it was once? Uh, we just made the video about her. She, she I, like, I, for, I forgot, but she didn't even have the ancestry, bro. So she she didn't have anything. Yeah, she didn't, yeah. she didn't have a single a single thing. That's but what you're touching up on is kind of leading up into Ricardo's next question. Okay, yeah, yeah. we'll just move on to the next part then. Okay, um, I know people listening because I know when I when you guys have you know episodes and there's comments. So so before we move forward, I do want to say that um, I like I said before, I do acknowledge. Uh, there are recognized communities, right, um, in the U.S., you know, and I've had people like Gregorio come on from, from his community and, you know, James uh, from his community. They're both unrecognized, and I consider them Native, right? And even within the unrecognized communities, they acknowledge that there's fraud, right, and we had this conversation when, you know, Dr. Gregor Gonzalez came on. He was talking about fraud f- within these people that are trying to claim indigeneity from, by, from his community, right? And it's, it's, and people don't acknowledge that. They, they, you know, people like to paint a picture where it's only federally recognized natives saying this and that. But, you know, there's, you know, even within the unrecognized community, there's like, hey, man, this community here or this people, group of people here or this organization here, they're frauds, they say it too. And I think that's part of like, we have to protect uh, the integrity of like, um, you know, uh, of of our sovereignty. And I, you know, I think maybe we should touch a little bit about mestizaje. So people that are listening in Mexico, mestizaje was like, you know, everybody, you know, can have, you know, tell me if I'm right or wrong. It was like, hey, everybody is mixed. So let's continue on this colonial version, colonial project of Mexico. You know, everybody has a little bit of um, uh, uh, Spanish, right? Or have some Spanish blood or whatever, you know, they want to say. So like they want to continue living society in a colonial way. And so they mixed up um, uh, Black and Indigenous and anybody else, right? And to to assimilate, it's kind of like, it's it's almost like uh, Americanism. You know, anybody can be American. It doesn't matter what color you are, right? It's a nationality. Yeah. So, but, you know, they, they made it into like more of an ethnic thing, you know, because American is not really an ethnic. It's just a nationality, right? So right. in Mexico, mestizaje is more like, hey, we're all a little bit, you know, indigenous. Uh, we're a little bit black. We're all a little bit, you know, um, 
Spaniard, you know, or the people like to brag about being Spaniard. Some people like to brag about that, uh, but you know, fuck them. You know, but you know, it's <laughs> yeah. one of those things that that. But that was a policy. People don't realize that if you can, people can Google indigenismo was the actual policy for implementing like mestizaje, and it was pushed in academia in Mexico for a long time. You know, and oh, then yeah. that, and then, and then that transformed into Chicanismo, right? And that's what we have, you know, the people citing within Chicanismo, uh, Jose Vasconcelos. And if you read Jose Vasconcelos, it's super fucking racist, right? Oh, yeah, no, extremely racist. We, we've covered some of it. He's talked about, like, um, redeeming the Black and mixing him out of existence. It's disgusting stuff. Yeah, so, you know, with Jose, uh, it's one of those things that he uh i read somewhere that he was funded by the like the nazi party to for his newspaper timon right and that his his book i had to when i read it i had to step away a couple of times i put the book down i was like i was like, i can't know how i'm going to finish this book um and i was thinking to myself how can people teach this in class right it's really yeah. like grotesque um, but then you know, at the same time, when you get when you get people like Gloria Anzaldúa, uh, uh, she cites Jose as like a fucking hero, right? And people w- pr- pretty much worship Gloria uh, in, in her writings. And I read Gloria this, this in December. I, I reread her book, and I was like, this is disgusting, right? Yeah. This is, it's a, it's, to me, it's just the book was like. It was just really bad. So, you know, we, we go back to Frida and Diego. They, they, um, they also pushed indigenismo. So why people glorify Frida? I don't know. Chicanos do, but, you know, indigenous communities have called out, you know, Frida. I mean, she's, she's passed, obviously. But, you know, for, for the, you know, indigenous people in Mexico have called out her out for misappropriation for, of, of culture and identity you know, indigenous identity. And um, Diego as well, you know, there was a thing of where Diego had like a collection of, of artifacts, uh, you know, indigenous artifacts, and he had a book and he mis- mis- misclassified them, you know? And there was a lot of things where, you know, they they just took the aesthetics to push indigenismo, to push mestizaje. So, you know, they, this whole thing of like um, everybody, is a little bit native, or if you look native, you're native. To me, that's just the continuing p- process of indigenismo. You know, I was I was I was giving a lecture in San Antonio, and we're before COVID, and I was giving like the history of the federal Indian law um, uh, lecture, and uh, one of the people there that was you know it was, it was her, I don't know what it was. It was like art space studio, and you know she was Mexican. You know, and, and then she said, oh, don't talk to me about, indi- you know, indigeneity. I know somewhere my ancestry, ancestry, I'm a little bit Aztec. And I was like, bro, did you not hear my lecture? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what the fuck? It, it's, it's, to me, it's weird that, you know, um, that people, they take these stories or they take like, hey, I'm a, you know, phenotypes and they don't understand history. And then on top of that, they romanticize uh, and fetishize indigeneity, um, especially Aztec, Aztec um, uh, culture or Mexica culture, you know, when they don't know if they're actually Mexica, right? And yeah. they, they have like a lot of aesthetics, Mexica aesthetics on their stuff. And to me, you know, that's indigenismo. That's a cellular colonial project that's happening right now. So when people tell me or when I see it, you know, like, oh, I'm detribalized. I don't know if I'm native. And they start, you know, role playing as native or cosplaying, whatever you, you know, you, you want to, however you want to say it. To me, that's, that's, the, that's a continuing policy of indigenismo. And I think it's, it's really sad because these same people don't understand sovereignty, right? And, and, and they still start, start saying stuff like, hey, I'm just reclaiming my sovereignty. But sovereignty is not an individual 
uh, movement. It's a, it's a community. And yeah. people asked me last month, I gave another lecture uh, last month, and uh, somebody asked me, could the tribalized people get together and start a tribe? I was like, no, that's fucked up, you know, because that's just going to snowball into other people making up stuff. You know, and that's that it's gonna it's gonna like out of control. You know, there was a situation, I'm gonna tell a story, not gonna name names, where somebody came to my house, I gave a lecture, the lecture rights, and I gave him two lectures, it was really long, it was like three hours long. We, you know, I made Posole. This person came to my house with, with their spouse and their kids. And in my house, this person admitted that they were native, they were not native, right? And I was like, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't. Uh, tell people you're native there or give advice as native. That's all I said, right? And they're like, yeah, I see where you're coming from. I see what I'm doing that I'm doing wrong. And I was like, cool, man. When the person was leaving the house that night, I gave her one of my paintings for free. And I was like, you know, I was like, hey, man, you know, I told this person, you know, I apologize if I come off like strong, but, you know, I, if, after hearing this, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to just show people that, the exploitation can happen, right? And, you know, this person said, you know, sometimes good friends are the ones that be, are able to be honest with each other. I was like, cool, man, right? <laughs> like, we're cool, right? A week later, it was like online, like, you know, uh, uh, the person was posting stuff about, you know, how to be indigenous, you know, and they're just charging people in the community for like Aztec dancing, telling people that Aztec danza groups, Kapulis, are sovereign nations, you know? And I had, to, I had to pull this person aside. I was like, hey man, like, you're becoming worse. <laughs> like, yeah. you're, you're doing, you're becoming worse than you were before. Like, now you're, you're taking what I told you, twisting it so you can like, you know, I don't, I don't even know how you mental gymnastic that, but I was like, that's really like, <laughs> it's really sick. You know, and she yeah. was like, oh, you know, you're really sick. You know, this is my decolonial journey. And I was like, bro, like, that's not even, you know, if, if people read uh, decolonization is not a metaphor, that's one of the sections in the article where it talks about you cannot decolonize your mind and then magically the, the, the seller state disappears. That's not how it works. You know, it, you know, it's, it's all about our sovereignty. So, you know, it, it, to me, it's, it's almost like it's, 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 it's um, people don't like to admit that they're wrong or, or like they're, they're, they're so invested on, on like claiming indigeneity that they, it, it, when they openly admit, they don't know if they're native. This person was in my house saying this, right? And yeah. We have to be really careful, you know, I, I, that's what I'm saying, like, if you don't know you're from a community, in my point of view, research it and, you know, study the history of Mexico. You, you go back even further, study the history of Spain, you know, before before they came to Mexico for, the, for 800 years, a thousand years before that. And then and then you see, you know, what I'm talking about, you know, people making videos online that like tacos are indigenous. And it's like, bro, that's like an Arab thing. <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's wild. It, to me, it's just like everything, everything they do is indigenous. Like if I eat tamales, I'm indigenous. If I eat pozole, I'm indigenous. It's like, you know, how do you know people can share recipes? You know, like everybody in Mexico, you know, like eats similar food. It's part of like the society that, you know, during cellular conversation, you know, just because I eat a hamburger doesn't make me fucking European, you know, like what the fuck? <laughs> a fucking hot dog or whatever so yeah no i, I was gonna ask uh for for some people that might not be as familiar i, I wanted to read the um indigenismo definition as put by like um that mexican anthropologist i cited earlier mm -hmm. uh so he says uh indigenismo did not in any way con uh contradict the national plan that the triumphant revolution has been crystallizing which that was uh mestizaje to, to incorporate the Indian, that is, the Indianize him to make him lose his cultural and historical uniqueness. The question is how to do it more effectively. That was um, said by Manuel Gamillo, the first professional Mexican anthropologist uh, who purported indigenismo. So for people, uh, yeah, indigenismo was about de-Indianizing. It's about assimilating into mestizaje the whole, we're, we're uh, one big happy family that's mixed and the same. 
I just yeah, wanna... we're all, we're all a little bit native supposedly, and we're all a little bit black. We're all a little bit, you know, like all these different things, it's, especially Sahe, you know. So um, I think you know people need to study uh, this this history of Mexico because uh, like it's just it's it's so insane what the colonization has, that has happened in Mexico that people don't know. And you know, the more the more you study it, the, the more you see, may, maybe you know. In my point of view, the priority are the, the communities that are there now, right? Uh, and they should have, you know, a stronger voice. But okay, next question, real quick. Um, let me see where am I at? Uh, can somebody that has been detached from an indigenous community claim indigeneity? I think we covered that, right? Uh, yeah, I, th I think I think, I think so. Somewhere, part. yeah. So, so can people part. that claim to be detribalized misappropriate culture, language, opportunities from any native, any any indigenous uh, community they see fit? Absolutely not. Yeah, sure. They wait. Can, oh, can, yeah. Oh, oh I mean, like, did they make the mistake of doing that? Yeah, they, but sorry, I want to let you go first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. He he was asking. Uh, yeah, they do make the mistake, and I've seen this countless countless times. But the question was just. Uh, can they do that? Can they misappropriate? Should they do that? It's better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. <there's> <laughs> yeah. No. That. Uh, no. Absolutely. Absolutely not. They shouldn't misappropriate. And uh, I remember, uh, Rick, you sent us an article about Chicanos um, with eagle feathers and with Lakota tribal items, right? Okay. So uh, we're gonna. Me and Marcus want to cover that article in the future, uh, calling that out because that is a, a huge problem. But no, absolutely. Not people just because you're detribalized doesn't mean you can start going around and and putting on uh, Plains Indian headdress or or you know just getting any of these other indigenous community items like Nawa items, um, Comanche items, any of this, and just start wearing it like it's all it's all one and the same. Like just because you're you're uh, detribalized, you can just do whatever you want. That's really unethical. Uh, what one thing is if, is if like you know there's people that are indigenous that do sell items. That's another story because you're, you're helping, right. They're, and they're, you're, you know, they're selling it. That's because they don't care if you wear it or not. That's why they're selling it in the first place. But another thing is just to go and start wearing sacred items or just taking whatever you want, just because it looks cool. And because you want to take pictures and, and brag online, like it's really messed up. And I have seen people that, that have done that. And me and Marcus have condemned this on our podcast time and again, uh, because that is just cultural appropriation. And it's uh, really messed up. Yeah. Nobody wants to look like uh, the California Karen in that classroom. I think that one show what I <laughs> talked about. In oh, that video. yeah. The dancing math teacher. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, that was so bad, man. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, you know, when it comes to cultural appropriation, that's the part of like um, the exploitation part because, you know, they take the identities to, you know, uh, obtain material wealth, material, you know, like uh, monetary, you know, wealth. And I think it becomes really tricky, you know, and there's laws. Like there was that, I think I showed you that, did I show you the article or they sent it to you about that uh, Chicano studies department that had that museum, not museum. Yeah, it was like an art exhibit. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I was referencing, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know they made a, like a sweat lodge in there, and they had like uh, other feathers and other stuff that you know broke federal laws. Um, and there are laws to protect, you know, the native people have, uh, you know, um, fought for, and you know, protection of our, our you know, sacred items is is one of them, especially you know, spiritual, religious, whatever you want to call it, you know. And and I think. Um, I've seen a lot of people do that. They will be growing peyote in their backyard, you know, and I, you know, it's just concerning, you know, and I'm like, why are you growing peyote in your backyard? Because I'm native, but you're really not native. Like you're, can you be, be tribalized? Because, you know, I do have friends that, you know, claim to be these things. And I, I, I do say stuff like I'm not in a non-dick way, in a non-jerk way, you know, like I'm like, hey man, what the fuck? You know, and I'm not trying to like make them feel bad, but it's like maybe you shouldn't be doing that because, you know, if somebody rats on you, <laughs> there's it's a federal crime. You know, I wouldn't even do that. <laughs> so it, it's one of those things that, um, 
you know, by the same time, it's exploit exploitative for, you know, uh, for the community. Like, you know, people think because, hey, I, I'm detribalized, I think I'm native, I should have access to this and that and from these communities, or because I'm detribalized, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, you know, befriend native people and then go to their ceremony and the, you know, decolonize de 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 my mind, you know, with their friendship and their ceremonies. And, you know, it's kind of weird, man. Like, you know, and they're always wearing native stuff, you know, they buy that shirt, like phenomenally indigenous or whatever, resilient indigenous, you know, whatever those shirts say, you know, and it's like, are you indigenous if you don't have that shirt? I don't know, you know, it's so corny. And I think, I think, you know, I had an elder tell me that um, I don't have to wear, you know, to, to especially with, with non-natives, to wear anything and, and look a certain way to, 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 you know, show my indigeneity. I'm who I, you be, be who you are and you don't have to, you know, prove it to anybody else. So to me, it's really odd when like people that claim to be detropolized, like really go out of their way to try and look native, right? And, and it's just like, you know, like, it's just weird to me. It's just weird. Like, you know, like, I think it was time and, you know, appropriate time and space, you know, to be, you know, to, to you know, for these certain stuff. And, you know, if, if some people want to have long hair, whether they're indigenous or not, it's fine. You know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have be indigenous to have long hair, but just, you know, it's just, uh, you know, if you, you know, if these people don't know if they're indigenous and they're doing stuff like, I'm going to grow my hair because I think I'm an indigenous, I'm an indigenous person. And this is what, this is how I'm going to decolonize. It's, it's kind of odd to me, you know, because that's how, how does you grow your hair? That's not as a native person, but as a person that doesn't know they're native, like how does that help native people? Shouldn't you be learning like our issues, right? Shouldn't you be hearing our communities um, uh, and our, 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 the issues we're, we're dealing with in our communities, the struggles we have, or like, you know, or the programs that help us out or, you know, organizations that are, are helping out, you know, being, being involved, having solidarity with, with, with us. Like it to me, it's very individualistic. Some some people that you know they they want to take that role and then just you know like uh, you know like kind of like a self preserve self preservation self promotion. You know, Do, am I making sense? I don't know. No, yeah, you're you're, yeah. you're making complete sense. So yeah, I think that's that's the um, you know I just hope that. You know, and it's fine if you are native and you don't know that your culture that much. I think people that are, you know, part of the community that know a lot about language and culture should help natives that don't know as much. And I think it's also a dick move for, for them to like hold back tradition, hold back language, hold back all these things. And I've seen it and I'm grossed out by it, right? Same thing with native people. Like you can't, you sh we should be helping each other in our community. Somebody comes up to you and doesn't know it doesn't know, you know, stuff they want to learn. We as Native people should help each other, you know? And I, just like my kids, my kids are not enrolled in the Comanche Nation, but they're in Comanche language class. People know who they are. Everybody knows who my kids are, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things like they, everybody sees them as Comanche, they're learning Comanche. My daughter knows more Comanche than I do. I'm happy for that, you know? Yeah, it's you know, pretty I, awesome. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's one of those things that, I, I, I'm grateful for, you know, but that's community. We, we all know who we, we, you know, we are, you know, with each other, but, you know, uh, you know, I know this is a little off topic, but if somebody is, you know, native in your community, help them out, don't push them aside and don't be, don't, I think those are the gatekeepers within communities. They, they, they know your, your community member and they don't help each other out when it comes to preserving language, you know, uh, history or, or culture, you know, that's fucked up. So I acknowledge that. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, uh, Rick, just to touch up on, on one thing is, um, like I'll re-mention it again, essentially, is uh, with a lot of detribalized natives, I, I've encouraged them to please do your research, do your research, like talk to your family, see where your roots actually come from. Don't just go and claim to be uh, an Aztec or a Mexica. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Go actually do some work, please. 
Uh, and people, because I've done this, people have now started calling me a gatekeeper and, and that, uh, that, yeah, a trader and all these ridiculous things when it's just like, all I'm saying is to put in some work, like, don't be lazy. Don't be just sitting here and want to do the wrong thing and just claim something that you're obviously not, or you don't even know you're going to claim a specific ethnic group and you have nothing to back that up. You're not even a descendant. You don't even know that for sure. And you're going to claim a specific ethnic group, but yeah, people have been, uh, getting mad at me for that, but it's just like, this is common sense stuff. Like, how are you going to claim a specific community if you don't even know you descend from them? It's ridiculous. Yeah. I got some flack too, but I'd made like a TikTok video about like how you shouldn't claim, you know, these certain identities and like say you're Aztec or something like that. And there are people getting on me and like saying, you don't get to decide who can be who I'm like, I'm not like, I didn't say I, I was a police of anyone, but I'm just like, saying what you should do that's morally you know right or you know obviously wrong um <clears throat> so it's just funny to see people get mad at that um yeah you know it's one thing i saw is that the police and not for your not for your um comment i didn't see i didn't see that comment but i've heard that that term uh indigenous police and i think that's a really sick thing to do or it's a really sick thing, thing to say is when indigenous people are trying to, you know, teach people or correct people in, in their exploitation or in their wrongdoings, especially people that somebody that doesn't know they're native or not, and to compare that, that indigenous person as indigenous police, it's just, to me, it's gross. You know, you're, you're comparing it to like a settler state fucking policeman. It's totally on, 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 uh, you can't do that, you know, just because, you, you know, your feelings get hurt or, you know, you, that person's not understanding. It doesn't get you, you know, make that person that have the right to compare that person to a settler state and entity. Also, the same thing with like that term um, indigenous and in, toxic indigeneity. There it goes. I saw that post and I was like, a lot of people were shocked that that, that came out. I was just like, holy shit, you know, and it was like, you know, native people that in the, in the post said that native people that knew their culture and, the, and their history are privileged. And to me, that's also very what sick thing fuck? to say. Yeah, a very sick thing to say, to say that the native people that grew up in their communities are privileged. These people fought and died for our cultures, our history, our languages, everything, ceremonies to stay alive. There is no privilege to that. You know, like people fought, you know, and, and died for this. They, they, they fought you know, legally or they fought physically and lost their lives, you know. So, you know, we can't. Um, that's to me, just having those posts. Um, it was by like a brown beret person. And I was just like, bro, like, what are you saying? Like, it, it's people like, you know, they, they try to demonize indigenous people to, um, there's a lot of that going on. We can talk about that maybe later or now, I don't, I don't know. But there's a lot of like demonizing, like, oh, you're a US native and you, or, oh, you know, you, you don't, you're a white passing native. By the end of the day, you know, like they're native people. If somebody doesn't understand something, I will tell you, I have said this before that I feel like I can see the, the criticisms that indigenous people in Mexico um, have with the US natives. And I can see, you know, uh, I can see it, you know, but it doesn't mean we should like create a division between us. We should actually be helping each other understand, right? And somebody from, that's from both sides of the border, indigenous from both sides of the border. I, I try, I tell, I tell, I tell native people in the U.S. like, hey man, like have you, you know, we can study all day U.S. native history, but we also have to study Mexican. Uh, and th this, they have a different uh, fight, a different, you know, historical some similarities and uh, some very different from, you know, the conversation in the U.S. and we have to understand. And, and vice versa, you know, I had a, a indigenous friend from Mexico and, and we were talking, you know, me and her, and, you know, I was talking to her about indigenous sovereignty and, and she was like, I don't know any of this. And I was just like, you know, she was like, these conversations are not being had in my community. And so we, had, we went back and forth, like how, could these conversations come about? So, you know, I think, you know, we, we can't be creating divisions when it comes to, you know, Southern natives and Northern natives. At the same time, we can't pan Indianize everything like, oh, we're all the same. I don't believe that, you know, we're, we're not all the same. We're not one people. We're many different peoples, you know?
with with our own cultures and languages. I say this many times on this podcast, so many times. <laughs> so you know, we can't lump everybody as one. I see that picture of like a a U.S. native and an Aztec person like shaking hands is like one people, you know, may, or many tribes, one people. And it's just like, uh, I don't know about that. You're not one people, you know, uh, our, you know, we, have, we all have our own sovereignty, tribal government, economies, you know, uh, to me, it's a kind of a cringe thing to post, you know, but this is me. The, uh, eagle and the condor. Oh, yeah. Perhaps might be an image that you might be referring to or thinking of. Um, I wanted to just run by one thing with you, Rick, and I hope that I mean by this point you understand. Uh, as far as like what Wanchelo and I um, think about this, is that like I know like the whole you said that detribalized thing has been like a kind of going on for the past few years and has recently caught up more in terms of people wanting to also be a part of this movement um <clears throat> but i just hope that you know that you know Wanchlo and i would would call out anyone that would want to uh, take on an identity that's not theirs oh, I, I believe um, you know i'm not saying you, you would you know, oh yeah yeah, yeah i know yeah yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm just yeah i just wanted to make sure that I, see, I see i see i see that one video you made it was that not all mexicans are indigenous you know it came up you know and i was like oh okay cool whatever <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I got a flag for that too. I was like, what? I was like, no. I saw, I saw that. Yeah. It was, it was just insane. Like, <laughs> it's so wild how like uh it, it's it's because it, it's it's ignorance. It's like the lack of understandings, the lack of you know, people getting their politics, they're getting their their um their views from like posts, memes, you know, they're not they're not understanding, and it's really shallow views. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's just like, you know, it's it's just like, you know, why would they teach Vasconcelos anymore in, 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 Ch in Chicano studies? They still do, you know, like it's just, you know, it's lack of understandings, so a lack of understanding of why this is harmful, you know, mm -hmm. it's harmful rhetoric. And I think, you know, some people, you know, they they start learning and they say, okay, this is harmful, let's move forward. But even Chicanos themselves, you know, they they're speaking out against uh uh you know the rhetoric that's dangerous like in aslan you know mestizaje indigenismo all these things that are you know like everybody is aztec you know all these things that uh yeah. that are like really weird and they they you know there's it's it's a growing it's a growing thing now and it's there's the old school chicano sources you know that are old school and they want to stick to being aztec you know, and there's like the new school that are starting to recognize this. And I, I, I applaud the younger generation. I do, you know, and I think they, ha I think they have it. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm proud of them and I'm, I'm glad it's happening, this conversation. So, yeah. Right, let's move to the next question. <laughs> if anybody has something, something to say or not, or. Yeah, I was just going to add on. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad the younger generations too are catching on more. Okay, next question is, should people uh, charge for online classes about indigeneity, indigenous, indigenous issues? You guys can go first, you know, about this, because I have a little, little rant about this, too. Okay, yeah, for sure. And um, I might end up changing my mind after hearing what you have to say. I guess what I would say is... I don't I actually I don't know. I'm I, I'm I haven't thought about this issue too much, but I would say that if they are, they need to be really upfront about their certifications, their qualifications and who they are and not present some false or fraudulent image if they're going to do this because that, then you're just fooling people and stealing their money essentially. So like I would say they has they have to be very transparent if they're going to do this. Uh, whoever it is in question, right? That way the person that is going to enroll knows what they're buying. Yeah, kind of agreeing with Wanchelo on that, that they, they do understand like what they're, um, you know, putting their money into and, and listening to. But, and I do think that, you know, learning about decolonization, particularly in, in this very moment of the, uh, the American timeline um, is important. Um, but yeah, again, like people knowing what they're, um, what they're investing in, definitely. 
So yeah, agreeing with one Yeah, thank you, both of you. Um, yeah. I think I want to go back to the early 2000s, you know, and it, it goes with what, you know, what my opinion, you know, uh, I think both of you maybe have heard of the Mexica movement, right? And um, have you? Yes, yes, we have. And we, and we heard about a lot of the problems associated with that movement. Yeah, so back in the early 2000s, um, I came in contact with people. It was a really small organization, like less than 10 people. And it was ran by somebody named Olin. I don't even think that's his, that's his real name. I think he was just, he gave himself an Aztec name, right? And um, he was telling people like every, every, every Mexican is, 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 you know, indigenous, Mexica, every, they're all Nicadaca, whatever they, they, they said. And I was like, hey man, you know, I asked questions, you know, cause you know, I was just like, you know, like just curious, you know, I was like, what am I, I'm Comanche, you know, like, what am I, you know, am I consider, you know, what would consider me? And they're like, oh, you're Nicotalka, you know, everybody, all indigenous people are Nicotalka, whatever. And I was like, oh, that's weird because Comanches, we have, we, we, you know, we don't call ourselves Nicotalka, we call ourselves like Namana. So, you know, we're, you know, and it's, you know, and I asked, I was like, they, you know, over time I started understanding that they wanted to have everybody learn now, right? And I, to me, it was weird. Why now? Right. <clears throat> and, you know, and so it is strange because this vision of assimilating natives into like Aztec language and culture was the same thing. The person that came to my house, you know, that person was not part of the Mexica movement. That's the same thing that that person that came to my house and admitted they were native. That person told me the same thing. They said that you know, she thinks that all natives should be assimilated into Aztec language and culture. And I was like, that's sick. We have our yeah. own languages and our culture, right? I was like, what you're saying is really disturbing. And I, this person was still in my house. I still fed them. I still was real nice to them, you know? And it, after saying that, I was like, you, you know, I was like, this is really disturbing, you know? And people like that, I don't understand. So when I was, you know, involved, I involved, but like, you know, interacting with that organization, seeing where, why the fuck people thought like that, you know, what the fuck? I said, hey, man, I don't know why, why I asked this question, but I was like, hey, what do you guys think about oral stories from, from elders, right? Oral stories from the communities. One dude in that, I forgot, I don't know his name, like, I, I don't remember people's names, right? Um, other than one, two people in that organization, three. But, you know, that person said, and I quote, F elders, end quote. And I was just like, bro, what the fuck? Like, I was like, I'm out. Like, uh, you know, like, I, this, this group is like fucking stupid as fuck. And, uh, and then everybody was like, yeah, yeah. You know, we get our culture from books. I was like, you can't get your culture from a book, you know? And they, that's what they were touting. They were touting that, you know, uh, that Mexico is not a settler state. It's a it's an indigenous state. First, I don't know how they thought about that. How, how the fuck do they think about that? Yeah, I was like, what about the history of Mexico? And you know, with I guess it's, it's indigenous people, and it, yeah. it's always like they had no answers to these things. So, but you know, like I was talking about sovereignty, and they would say some some stuff like sovereignty is a white people shit, and I was just like. That's, that's a, that doesn't make sense. You obviously don't know what sovereignty means or what it is if you're claiming that, you know, our, our sovereignty is white people shit. So, yeah. you know, like, you know, this organization, you know, there was a member that was there and she was saying all the same shit and, you know, like um, scolding me. I was just like, ah, whatever, dude, like, okay, that's cool, man. And I left and, you know, now this person is, you know, more more popular and is selling online course courses to about you know history of mexico you know decolonization and charging people 220 dollars you know when you know with that person you know let's say like 15 years ago uh was really ignorant to native to native you know issues and now sending classes you know, it's still saying ignorant shit, promoting the idea of deep tribalization, you know, like not understanding how their views are harmful and refuses to listen, Re refuses to listen to any native person that, that, you know, has criticisms for them. And 
And that's dangerous because if, if Native people are telling you, hey, man, your words are fucking harmful. And if, you, you know, if, if, they, if their reactions are, oh, you're just a naysayer. No, it's not. We're telling you that you're harmful, you know, and maybe you should sit down and listen. And, you know, this person sells classes. They sell like, you know, uh, purses and shirts and all these other things. And just, it's, it's, expo- it's like exploitation, in my point of view you know, to ma- be making money, you know, of indigeneity and like half-assed issues. Not only that, you're, pro- you're, you're pushing agendas and you're pushing ideologies that, like I said, have roots in indigenismo, right? And mestizaje. So, you know, it, and it's, it's hard because sometimes, I, you know, I, I try to, you know, talk to this person and it's, it's hard. It's really hard. It's like people... They, they have egos. They, it's like they're marketing themselves by using an indigenous mask by doing so. And it's, to me, that's dangerous that, you know, people that don't understand indigeneity, indigenous issues, you know, in, in, their, in their harmful rhetoric will just continue to do it. You know, it's like, oh, well, I got to make it somehow in capitalism. But like, that's like literally the most dishonest and the worst way you can do it is by exploiting indigeneity. You know, like I don't make I don't make any money from this podcast. You know, like I made now one dollar. I had Patreon, but nobody donated, and I turned it off. I was like, I feel bad for asking for money, so I was like, no, you know. But it's like, and I do lectures, and I charge no no money. It's all free, you know, my time. So I don't understand, you know, people that charge, you know. And I understand that people want to help people understand about indigeneity and decolonization. But sometimes, you know, like if somebody says, hey, man, this is a little bit off, I think you should, I think people should listen, you know, and, and correct themselves. Everybody goes through a journey, you know, blah, 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 you know, people that say that, you know, this is my journey. But, you know, if your journey is like exploiting people in the way, that's a fucked up journey. You know, that's a fucked up thing. It's, you know, it's just, I don't know. So thoughts, questions, complaints. Marcus, you got anything? I got no complaints uh, about anything so far. But, well, I mean, well, adding on to what you were saying, uh, Rick, that I definitely think that um, it'd be important to get, like, for example, if I were to ever want to teach a class on, you know, for example, sovereignty or something, obviously I would want people that were <laughs> that were from indigenous communities there with me and with the approval of that. Something, and an example of what I mean, or just teaching of, of, of decolonization, I think, having those that have suffered through, um, uh, you know, the issues regarding colonialism, uh, for example, again, people from indigenous communities um, that would be able to speak on this and having them there, uh, I think would be really beneficial. But um, again, I've never taught any, oh, well, hmm. you know, I have experience as an instructor but that was in college and high school a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I think that if I'm teaching in a, a decolonial class, it would be important to uh, let others also, you know, speak their mind that um, have went through uh, issues of colonialism too, because I know not if I'm talking from my perspective, at least um, I would say that my life um, with colonialism, colonization. Um, I, I, I never went through a whole lot, I can honestly say, um, growing up. Uh, but I know a lot of people that have gone through a lot of problems. So yeah, just having others speak and letting them talk, if I were to um, teach a class on that. Yeah, that that and just having, like, being upfront about your certifications and your qualifications of, like, you know, for example, like, I wouldn't want to go teach an actual history class where I'm charging people money about the history of Mexico. And it's like, well, I don't have any, I don't have a degree in history. I don't have any certifications with Mexican history. Like, you know, so, you know, they need to be really upfront with who they are and what qualifications they do have. If, if they're going to be doing this that way, people know, and they're not misled because that's, that's the problem um, here is it's just fraudulent. If you are misleading people, with, with who you are and what your qualifications are when it comes to an issue like this. 
or if I were to teach a class on Indian culture, I would want, even though like obviously I'm from Peru and whatnot, but you know, I've lived here all my life and all of that. So um, I think having- I think some, some of the stuff shouldn't even be taught in class. This is my opinion, you know, because some of that stuff is like, I think it should be taught within the community, you know? Mm-hmm. So not everything should be, I think, I think you both have said this too, like not everything should be posted online, you know? And I, oh, I, yeah. I yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's, yeah. Um, I think I was going to say something, I forgot. Um, as far as the person not listening, I, I, I was going to say this, like when it comes to like these online spaces, I've just seen like how toxic it can get. So I can see with some people, they just put the blinders on and they don't want to listen to anything. And they're like, oh, it's all, they brush it off as it's all just hate. But um, I, I think, uh, I think there needs to be like critical lenses on if you're consistently getting attacked by one thing uh see why you know and not not just brush it off so like i'm hoping that you know this episode with you can open the door with a lot of people that maybe you see as problematic or or that you've had problems with uh and you know being think, willing you know, to sit down i do want to ask you because you brought this up and it wasn't on the list of questions it's like you said you want to bring up like you know uh the the, the topic of like people that you know, they, they couldn't be detribalized, they become kind of zealots, and they're like fucking like anti-white as fuck or anti-white people and just to a really aggressive point. You have to oh, yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to drop names, but yeah, I've, I've seen organizations uh, and they promote this and I just think it's horrible. It's like, uh, you know, things like white people as a collective are evil or, you know, just outlandish things like this or... Um, I have seen this. I think it's kind of cringe when you say like uh, um, they say, well, they, they like put KKK and whatever, like America with KKK. I don't know. All that shit's like really cringe in my opinion. But yeah, I've seen people that are like extremely anti-white and that that's not that's not OK. You know, yes, I understand that white people have a position of privilege in American society. I, I understand that white people historically have oppressed uh, people of color, right, and Native peoples, but that doesn't mean that every single white person is evil, you, you know. And so, painting them like that, it makes you know better than, than uh, it just makes you just as racist, in my opinion. To me, my my definition, my definition of racism is very old school. It's just hating somebody because of the color of skin and and their race. It doesn't matter uh, what race that person is. So yes, I think people can be racist against white people, and I think it's wrong to do that. To do that. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, I'm not going to say that because like these negative things about white people because my family's white, <laughs> um, as most adoptees are uh, have you know white families as well. Um, yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark has got attacked one time by uh, we're not going to drop names, but, but one one person saying something about his white family, and that was disgusting to see. Yeah, Whew, it was a while ago. Um, but yeah, I got I've, weird, I've gotten yeah. attacked before sorry that's weird that's weird yeah 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 it's really weird and like there's this organization i was a part of and they posted this meme and it was like of a cat saying me around like my family and then the other part of the meme was like me around white people and it was like a really angry cat and i was like what the f- <laughs> what's wrong with the and it was like a, a decolonial organization uh social decolonial organization and i was just like why do people I understand. Um, so yeah, I, I, and I do feel, and this is on a personal level, um, that a lot of that there are like decolonial organizations out there that in my eyes, I, I view as like somewhat being like anti-white because the things that they, they post is just like, like, why do you say those things? I don't know. It's just, and I could even go back to like even presidents, um, Mm, no, I won't say that, but, um, but yeah, just like certain people out there saying the, the, these things are like calling all, uh, white people colonists or like calling them all, you know, just these negative terms. And obviously I'm not for it. Um, I, I believe that the, the movement that Wanchelo and I have pursued, um, especially is important to have support from all people of backgrounds, um, so I'm not going to go and like shit on white people. Like it's, that's stupid. 
um, more what I what I never I wouldn't want to shit on any black people or anyone. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I don't that bring that that brings up something. Yeah, that sure. Brings, yeah, go ahead. Finish up. Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say like I, I don't see the the purpose of it. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, I will say that there's a lot of issues going on in like the social movements, decolonial movements that are in my eyes, I believe like somewhat anti-white. So that's why I don't really Id- identify as like some sort of uh, woke, as you say, um, social leftist or like um, what's the word called? Social um, justice warrior. Social justice warrior. Yeah. I do not know. Um, I can't agree with many other points of, social justice warriors too but mostly those in general i think those movements are actually quite bad and i think it's also bad for uh, the society in general to grow um but that's i could talk more about that that's for another time i think in terms of like where our society is going in 2022 um i think there's a lot of leaders not leaders but like so-called like um no, that's the word I'm looking for. Just very popular people that just say a lot of like not so true things and it, it hurts others. But anyway, I'll stop there. I was just going to add in, dude, like whenever I've said that people need to research and do genealogy, like if they, you know, if they don't know where they, who they descend from, people have been attacking me and they're like, oh, it's, it's white people papers. I'm like, dude, you sound stupid as shit saying that. Yeah. Or I like, I got crap one time on a, a TikTok video and someone was saying something like white people papers or something like that. And I was just like, so you're just going to generalize like all white people. So, and he was like, no, I'm being like decolonial or something like, no, that's not being decolonial. I don't understand. So what's white people paper? I don't oh, understand. Appa- apparently uh, the, the genealogical records like these church records when i'm telling people hey do your research to see who you descend from do your genealogy and apparently that's white people documentation that's white people papers and so therefore it, they're evil it's i don't know that that is i might say that's white people papers but i think that um you know like i don't know like i, I kind of see it but i think they're coming off the wrong way you know what I'm saying like I would say that uh, I'm pretty sure that the Catholic Church didn't understand like uh, community or ethnicity or you know uh, indigeneity. So like trying to base stuff stuff on the churches, you know, kind of it's kind of like uh, people that want to get uh, or to talk about record rec- uh, federal recognition in the U.S. Like who's the U.S. to say who is native and who's not, right? Is the people with the same have the same uh, things? Is like who? Why? Why would you base your indigeneity with the, the Catholic Church? And people fought that shit. They're still fighting in Texas, right? Because in in Texas, in San Antonio, the church proclaimed that a group of people were indigenous, and native people around were like, no, they're not, right? And this was in the nineties. <laughs> So there, there's a big thing, and I've been a whole episode about that. So two episodes about that. So you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's, but this is that's a whole different episode, you know. But I do want to bring up the the white uh, thing. I think the, you know, when people, first off, you know, everybody's seen, you know, some weird shit on Facebook. I'm like, that's some white people shit. You know, like the Karens, or whatever, and it's you know, like, it's just like because you know they they're just weird sometimes. But at the same time, like you know, we we have to understand that that's still a shallow way of like seeing things, right? Like, uh, we need to have solidarity with um, with everybody, you know, with in, in the Americas, not just indigenous peoples, you know. So we need to have you know, there, there's like. The struggles for black liberation. There's, uh, you know, the working class. The, you know, the, the their uh, material conditions and why, you know, uh, it, you know, the real enemy, settler colonization, is not white people, right? Settler colonization comes in many forms, you know, and as and it's assimilates everybody. So to you know just target white people to me is like you're not understanding. Uh, first of all, you're not understanding colonization. And then that means you're not understanding decolonization, and, and you know, and if you're, if the, you know, these people's goals is to just attack white people, then you know, 
you're just doing more damage than good, you know, and, uh, you know, and how can like, you know, non-native communities, you know, specifically whites, be in solidarity with you, you know, uh, if you are just saying fuck white people, you know, yeah. and not, not understanding, you know, that, you know, that they, their, their own material conditions within the settler states. Because I know a lot of uh, whites, people that are communists, and they understand. I bring that Rainer, Rainer Shea, you know, Rainier Shea, you know, comes on the podcast and talks about, you know, listening to indigenous people. He talks shit to like Caleb Maupin and all those other people, has, you know, and I think he's a good ally, you know, and to say fuck him is a disservice to the work he's doing too. You know, he's not speaking over indigenous people. He says that all the time. I'm, I'm, he says he will never speak over indigenous people. And, I, you know, I, I applaud him for his work he does. And I think, um, you know, there are allies. We have allies. So to say, you know, to categorize this whole group of people because, you know, it, it, to me, it's really, it's, really sh- it's really weird, you know? So I do agree that we shouldn't just generalize, you know, everybody. Like I said, you know, uh, cellular conversation takes on many forms. I don't think we should be attacking any racial group or anything like that. The next thing I want to bring up that Mark has reminded me of is the mestizaje and, and indigenismo is anti-Black, 100%, right? 100%, you know, there's even like uh, uh, criticisms, you know, from Black scholars of Jose Vasconcelos and of Gloria Ansel. So I think people should go listen to their voices because they say, you know, uh, stuff that, you know, is concerning. There's anti-Blackness in Mexico. And, you know, to, to, to you know, for people to um, assume that everybody that's brown in Mexico is, is you know, is indigenous and ignores Black history in Mexico. And Black history in Mexico is a big part of Mexico. So I have, I had Chicanos tell me that, oh, it's a very really tiny part of Mexico. Nobody really, nobody really, you know, it's not, it's not that important. No, it is fucking important. And, you know, and to say that it's fucking stupid as fuck and it's racist. So, you know, and I, I hopefully I can get people to come on to speak about that subject because I, I, I think that's a super important topic. And I think, um, you know, I, I know at the same time, you know, there's those uh, people that, uh, um, I don't even want to say the term, but, um, there's, there's, you know, there's like, uh, they, they come off really cringe, those like native people that they are native and they start attacking black people about, you know, um, it, it goes both sides, you know, like there's like, there's, there's certain groups of black people that say that native people are not the original people of the land, it's black people and we're the colonizers. That, you know, that needs to be addressed, you know, but in a way where we're not creating division you know, and, um, you know, uh, that's, that, you know, that's dangerous because there was an incident on the East Coast where like a, this group of people tried to take over a Native community, you know, and with, you know, I think it was like with weapons and it was just like really scary, you know, to read about. But, you know, there's all these things that are happening one time. It's all because of my point of view, people are not listening to one another, right? Or they, they, they make up these like, um, these stories in their head that they're the legitimate ones they're the legitimate ones and everybody's just like what the fuck uh so we have to understand that you know we have to there's there's whole other communities too i mean chinese people were brought here too you know forcefully or they were tricked to come here and a lot of people don't understand that too like you know uh they were brought here made, made indentured servants you know and they couldn't leave and then they couldn't marry something that wasn't Chinese. And then, you know, and then the people, those Chinese people also came to Mexico. And it's just, you know, I talk about this on my podcast. When I was a kid, I went to Mexico and there was, we went to a Chinese restaurant and Chinese people there were from China. And my stepdad was talking in Chinese and my mom was talking in Spanish, you know? So it was, it was, it was a really unique experience seeing like that going on in Mexico, you know? that and, and you know hearing their stories about why they came to Mexico, you know, and you know, it, it, it's 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 not just a black and white thing where it's like just Spaniards and just indigenous people in Mexico. We have a lot of rich history in Mexico from colonization that cannot be ignored. So yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. And actually, I'd like to go back a little bit. I would like to find someone at Chicano that actually supports, and I'm sure you've met a lot, Rick, but I wouldn't mind finding one that supports Mestizaje. So I don't know how you can be a Chicano and, and support, you know, that guy, let alone the, the, the movement of Mestizaje itself. <clears throat> well, so, some of them are just Hispanistas, bro. I mean, we, we've already fought them on our channel time and again. <laughs> you already know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. I think, um, but you know, we this is whole different conversations too. Like, you know, you know, even within Mexican communities, um people are are like, oh, you need to find yourself a white husband or wife, you know. <sighs> yeah. And it's like, oh, like, oh, you know, like your baby came out dark, that baby's ugly. Like, what the fuck? You know, like some weird yeah. shit like that. Yeah, you, you see those comments, like, uh, don't be an, don't be an Indio, you know, or you're being an yep. Indio. And mm-hmm. it's just like, that's like, fuck you, you know, like, uh, I hate that shit. And, and it's like, I hear that shit all the time from the Mexican communities from growing up, you know? And, you know, a lot of people, um, sorry, I muted myself. You know, a lot of people, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, growing up, like, I was kind of like undercover, like I, I'm Mexican, but I'm also native. So hearing that from like different, you know, going to like friends, family uh, events. And I was just like, what the fuck? And, you know, like the, those India Maria movies to me are racist as fuck, you know, and people like that shit. And people think it's like a heavy cultural, uh, uh icon in Mexico, like India Maria movies, you know, and it's just like, why? It's fucking weird, you know? And to me, it's ironic because, you know, people were, uh, the native people here in in the U.S. were like, oh, get rid of that native person, the native lady on the butter box, right? But if you go to, like, the Mexican stores, there's, like, native shit everywhere <laughs> on, on products, right? I'm almost like, <laughs> if they only went to these Mexican stores, it's like, it's, you know, these images are just being bombarded. On, on, on Mexicans, you know, like the aesthetics of indigeneity. And I think that's part of indigenismo, right? Like, hey, look at, you know, you're indigenous, you're indigenous, but are you, you know, and why is it on a packet of like seasoning? It's weird, right? And um, I don't know, maybe I'm ranting. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say indigenismo though, like I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're saying that they're indigenous because that's not the attitude. It's you're a mestizo, so you're a half breed and you're half white, and so therefore you're better than indigenous people. That that's really what the ideology is, more so than saying we're all indigenous. Because in Mexico, I mean, the attitude of we're mestizo is very different from you're a, an indigenous person. They 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 really scorn indigenous people just because of the whole you're you're part white, uh, and that's one of the well, that's what one thing me and Marcus are trying to fight here is this whole ideology of you're superior because you're white. You're part white. I think it's like the it's a same sword, but the, the, the different edge of a sword, right? It's like mestizaje, like everybody come be white, you know, because you're everybody Spaniard. But look, like we don't have to talk about native issues because we're all a little bit indigenous. So you know, if somebody says, "Hey, there's, there's this issue about in, in, indigenous people are having," hey, but guess what? Why do we have to hear that? Because we're all indigenous. Right. And right. Part, and, yeah. yeah. And I've seen I've seen. Yeah, I've seen this bullshit. Um, and, and that does deserve to be called out and eradicated this whole like, yeah, because I've seen it where Mexicans have told me online and Reddit. I mean, in person or whenever I've gone down there, it's like there is no racism in Mexico because we're all mestizos. And I'm like, no, that's complete horseshit. You know that there's racism in Mexico. There's literally books written by Mexican anthropologists like Mex- Mexico Racista by Federico Navarrete. It's like it, it, it's clearly an issue in Mexico. It's like so. But the whole, yeah, we're, we're mestizo is, is you so you can just sweep that shit under the rug and you can, you can um, justify all this oppression. Yeah, not only that is like the sterilization of women, indigenous women and poor, poor women in Mexico. That's happening right now, right? And uh, the femicide, the, you know, like the shit against the Zapatistas. I mean, if Mexico was an indigenous nation, why are you fucking with the Zapatistas? You know, yeah. like it was like it's like a common sense stuff. You know, that's one thing that it was like back in the, in the '90s and the 2000s, early 2000s. Somebody told me that I, I responded with that. I was like, "Why are we fucking with the Zapatistas?" Then I don't know. 
It's a stupid response. Mexico is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not. It's job. not. It's not it's a seller state. The Mexican government. I mean, the Mexican government is a, it's a seller state. It's not. You know, and, and people are like, "Oh, like I never thought about that." Well, what the fuck? You know. So. Yeah. No, we're not like this one big happy family singing kumbaya in Mexico. That's not how it is. Yeah, and it's you know, um, I do want you know, and it's hard as a native person because. Uh, this is why I went to law school. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan to, you know, but I was kind of like guided towards it. And since I was always talking about sovereignty and these issues, that's why I went to law school. But it's hard, man, because I talked about this in the early 2000s. I didn't have a bachelor's. I had my bachelor's and then people were like, oh, you only have a bachelor's, it doesn't mean shit. Like, okay, now I, I went to, you know, to my law, got law school, you know, got my degree. And it's like, oh, you only have a law degree. And it's like, oh man, you never win, you never win. You know, you never, you never, you never, nobody ever hears you, it's weird, you know, it's like. It, that, that's think, ridiculous, a, a Juris doctor degree is is very good qualification, man. Uh, I think. Congratulations you know, on it. No, I don't have, wait, I'm not a lawyer, by the way. I just have a law degree, so yeah. So is it oh, like, but still, but still, yeah, that's still high education. Though. That's like what the equivalent <laughs> to a master's, right? So yeah, it's a master's. Still very, a master's. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a lot of education. Dude, most people don't have a master's. So anyone that's saying that, oh, you only get a master's, is is just, I mean, pardon my language, but retarded. That's what I'm going to say. I think you know, uh, it's rough, you know, with social media and circling back to the beginning topics. You know, we have to listen to each other. Stop bickering. We, you know. Uh, if somebody, if anybody criticizes, you know, anything on the podcast, just contact me and we can talk about it. You know, don't, you know, you also have to realize too, if somebody's that you've never met in your life is giving you slander to spread about somebody else, you don't know who these people are. You know, you don't know, you don't know what harm you're doing. You don't, you don't know anything like that. So to just trust anybody on the internet for their word, I don't, I don't do that, you know, and, you know, also don't, I'm not going to um, argue with anybody with the podcast. People tag me on stuff, like say something. I'm like, no, <laughs> because I'm not, you know, I'm not here. I, I don't. You know, I don't I don't make money from this and I'm not going to spend my time for my kids and my family and my work to to online or bicker with with other pages about dumb shit. You know, like if, if people want to have yeah. a conversation, they can just come on the podcast and we can have the conversation. And if you don't, then, you know, then you just walk away. Pretend I don't exist. It's cool, man. You know, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, for sure. Well, me and Marcus have learned a lot after being on here for like a whole year. Uh, you can't trust anybody online. This has probably been the biggest lesson uh, and one one that you mentioned. So definitely. Yeah, it's, it's hard because, um, you know, it's like, I feel like, you know, these pl- people, the podcasts have exploded, especially over the last, you know, five, six years, a lot of people that make podcasts, I do listen to them, you know, not mine. I, I, you know, and I don't, I hate listening to myself, but I listen to my, you know, my friend's podcasts and other people's podcasts randomly. People send me stuff all the time. And I do listen to them when I'm working out or when I'm driving. And I think, you know, um, we have to know why we're doing this. And so people understand, I started this podcast with, um, uh, for for several reasons, for, I started with a, with a black woman, you know, Lou V, and to have because I was working with a uh, Black Lives Matter organization in San Antonio, and to build solidarity, you know, between our communities, and then uh, it grew. We have other 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 hosts, you know, but at the same time, you know, I was tired of like having the same conversation over and over again or typing it out. So now when people ask me something, I just give them a, the, the link to an episode, right? And if they have questions, yeah, we can make a part two or part three, whatever, of the episode. And, you know, at the same time, you know, uh, I just feel like people don't understand Native issues and people have to learn. And, we, you know, I, I was a Native person, you know, um, 
I, I asked a question, you know, so I have white friends, you know, that were like, I don't understand this issue. And I said, okay, write down the questions. Let me see if I can make part two or part three, right? And I told my native, my native friend, I was like, hey, man, now I feel like I have to make the episodes in a way where non-natives, you know, can understand because it's going over their heads. And she said, fuck them. Like, don't, you shouldn't be making content for them. You should be making content for us. And I was like, well, if we don't have solidarity, if they don't understand, how can we have solidarity? You know? So I honestly believe that I, if somebody doesn't understand something on a podcast, they should ask. You know, just same with you, right? In your podcast, they should ask. You know, don't be like just assuming or just be like, oh, this, that. I don't understand this. So I'm just going to walk away from it. No, like you should ask questions and, you know, um, to, you know, further your understanding. And, it's just hard. It's hard out there to, you know, just uh, native issues is really tricky because it varies within the U.S. It varies within Mexico. It varies. Then you got like a Mexico, U.S., Canada, then Central America, then South America. It's all different. It's all different. It's very a lot of similarities, but it's a lot of different terms, a lot of different, you know, uh, concepts, you know, and ideas of what decolonization or indigeneity means. And I try to cover just. Uh, the top three, like the top three here in America, it's like Canada, US, and Mexico. Because I feel like I don't want to talk about, I don't think I have the right to talk about, you know, the other sections of the other parts of indigeneity. It's not my place, you know? At the same time, you know, it's hard when I hear, I see natives talk about fucking indigenous bourgeoisies, casino bourgeoisies, and not understanding how casinos uh, work in the US, indigenous casinos. I had to make a whole, ep- a whole episode about that because I was like, you know, the, the stuff I hear, the same thing as, like I said earlier, like, you know, U.S. natives doesn't, sometimes don't understand stuff down, you know, across the border. And at the same time, there's, there's misconceptions about our sovereignty, about our economies, you know, and it's, and it's, and we have to like understand and hear each other, not criticize and like talk what we don't know, you know? Yeah. It's all quiet now. <laughs> Got anything to say, Marcus? Oh no, I was just gonna add that you know it is important that like for a lot of podcasts out there, and not just like talking about indigenous issues, but just like to provide the uh, accurate information. Uh, Rick, I am thankful that you know you are able to like really inform us a lot, especially about uh, indigenous sovereignty and just a lot of other things in general, because I, I've learned a lot. Uh, particularly since, you know, you and I and, and Wanchalo have, have met and had a lot of um, good dialogue amongst the three of us. Um, so, yeah, I just want to, you know, be, you know, say thank you for that. Oh, thank you yeah. Guys for, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say like to other people, it's like when it comes to your views, views change over time, views evolve. So it's like, don't put your ego out there in terms of like, oh, I, I'm losing. I lost because I changed my view. It's like, no, if you, if your view is wrong, then it's perfectly fine and acceptable to change your view with new information that, that I don't know why this isn't normalized more, but, but that's completely valid to shift your view. I agree. And I, oh, that, you know, the other thing for the podcast is to talk about decolonization. And before I started the podcast, I was asking a lot of people, man, even the, the command chairman asked him how, what his, how he views decolonization and everybody gave different answers some people said that that's too far away or it's impossible or they had other you know other points of views of what it looks like and uh i will say my views have changed the more and more i talk and then the more and more indigenous marxists talk i i, I mean with indigenous marxists uh the more and more it, it, it up up Dates, you know, because they have their own vision of, of the conversation, which I fucking agree with. And, you know, I, I questioned even if I was a communist because I was working with a lot of like non native communist organizations. And I, there's whole episodes about that. But, you know, I, as time goes by, you know, I, I got reinforced and I got, and at the same time, I got, I, I, I it changed. My, some of my stuff changed. Like I became more communist. <laughs> so some people are shocked by that but i'm like yeah i'm super communist so you know it's one of those things that um you know i'm happy i'm happy i met uh indigenous communists and you know hear their points of view and you know it, you know it, it's 
they I'm glad I'm glad that I I, I cause, um and I if I were if I were up to me I'll be if I had money I'll be paying them to come on this fucking podcast but I don't have money or you know you know everybody's busy and just COVID and you know but I agree my, my views have changed and I've been you know uh, told I was wrong you know and. I believed, I said this before in the podcast, when I grew up in California, you know, when I was like a teenager, I believed the Chicano rhetoric of Aslan, of like all these things, you know, and so one day I I was, you know, um, a tribal member put me aside and she was like, and I quote, she said, you sound fucking dumb, you know, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And she, you know, she explained to me why. And I was asking more questions with other tribal members. And I, they were like, yeah, that's, that sounds fucking dumb. And I was like, okay. So, you know, I, I got put in my place, like, you know, and I know I did. And this is now I'm here because of that. I'm, I'm who I am because of that. People told me, hey, man, you're fucking wrong. You sound dumb, you know, or oh, that shit sounds dumb as fuck. And uh, yeah, don't, don't feel ashamed by it, you know? Don't, don't don't feel ashamed by it. I had a, a Chicana friend that she said when she, you know, before she met me, she went to the same thing. And she said that, you know, she for a week she she felt like she couldn't go out because she felt stupid that she thought all these things. And I was just like, I I felt I, I went through it too, you know, like I didn't know, like I was taught wrong. I was, you know, not not I didn't understand. It's okay to not understand. It's okay to ask questions, you know. You're right. So I do want to ask you before we get off, why did you guys start the podcast and you know, what are some good things and some bad things you got from it? I don't know. From your experiences. So we, uh, uh, we started because we, like I said, we just saw so much of people um, with the whole messy Zahe ideology. They want to think that they're better because of the whole I'm part white. And we see the problems that that's led to. Uh, well, I mean, both here in the U.S. among like uh, Mexican communities uh, or, you know, other, I, I guess for lack of a better term, Hispanic communities, uh, and then what happens in Mexico. And so we wanted people to search who, like search for who they are, like investigate their, fan, you know, their, their lineages and really do the work and also to, you know, to get closer to those indigenous roots rather than being so Eurocentric with, with everything. Uh, because that's just led to a lot of problems. Uh, so that that's why we started uh, the podcast initially. And uh, it, it's been good uh, over time, you know, like releasing episodes and getting feedback. And uh, now, right now, we've just putting been putting more like um, reading historical articles and informing people about like a lot of the history. Like recently we did um, some episodes on the Philippines. We still got to finish that up. But um but yeah, I would say negative. We've just had like attacks from a lot of Hispanistas over over the past year that we've had to deal with. But um, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, kind of you know, adding on to what Wanchaloa said. Um, yeah, one of the main points was to get rid of these you know Eurocentric views of uh, you know the indigenous identity, um, who we are, because I think that you know. Uh, there are a lot of anti-indigenous thoughts and, and views that, that come from you know Mexico and a lot of Central and South America, um, and you know they're brought here to the U.S. Um, I think it's also important to find out you know your roots that have been um, kind of covered up by I think Euro you know Eurocentric values, um, not just from um, south of the border but here in the United States too. Um, so our podcast serves as a, a place for that, for other people that also wish to, um, you know, learn more about themselves. And, you know, Wanchalo and I do, you know, cover um, important, I think, good readings um, about that. Um, we, I, we have people on to interview. We hold lives. Um, we got tons of other plans for this year. Um so yeah, and we get a lot of support too. So that's, it's really good. Um, and, you know, I always thank people um, on our videos for, for watching. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the, the really good things that come from our channel is that, you know, we're able to post videos about like where people can go to support like indigenous communities and issues going on. Um, we, I think Wanchala would 
we did just post a video recently, I think in December, regarding the um, a certain indigenous community, Lakota oh, community. There, yeah, there was one in Brazil that was that, yeah, um, that, that was asking for donations for um, because of the why the right rainwater type of issue and so they were asking for donations and in the past we've uh we've shared like christmas drives with the you know the lakota people and yeah uh, any other issues that we we see and 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 uh, you know rick if you ever have something like a you know a drive you want people to donate to or anything like that you can always share it with us we could post it on our channel that's one of the things we've we've enjoyed it's like channels grown significantly in a year and we enjoy like sharing these things because it's like we can get in front of a lot of people and they can go help yeah yeah, I'd say that's, that's sorry. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that's the best thing that I, I I enjoy from our channel is that we're able to bring people together under a, a common cause and then do good for community in the world here. Um, yeah, that's that. What I would say is that the uh, the best thing to look forward to of all of every anything, um, really. Um, and Rick, are you going to say something? No, I agree. You know, using your platform to help is, you know, good. Uh, it's the best, I think the best thing you can do, you know, uh, as, as a, as, you know, as a platform, as a you know, community. Um, I, I, you know, I, I have questions, but, you know, I don't know if you guys want to answer. I want to ask, you know, I know a lot of people, I don't know if they don't know or, you know, like, you know, uh, I think one thing that I, I connect with Juan is, uh, living undocumentedly, you know, and, and, <laughs> and it's not easy. So I don't know if Juan, you want to talk about like, uh, do you have any frustrations from like, uh, you know, like people in the U S whether it be any ethnicity, like Mexican Americans, you know, white people, anybody that when you talk, when you, when you, you know, tell them even back in the day, cause you know, back in the day or, you know, when I was, you know, even even having a green card was like uh, not something that you would want to tell people, you know. And I don't know if you want, you know, say any, any misconceptions, you know, you, you want to say about you heard from from, you know, people that. You know, yeah, Americans. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess probably the biggest thing is just. um people don't understand like when you don't have the citizenship and you are undocumented or you're even just an immigrant going through the process like people that are birthright citizenship citizens you know they have a lot of privilege in having that and they take it for granted a lot of times but but yeah i, I guess the one thing that's been super frustrating is just that type of attitude um where people you know, even if you inform them of the struggles you've had to go through, it doesn't factor into how they treat you or, or into understanding your positions. Uh, and just, you know, like even within my own family, like my brothers were U S born. Right. But, uh, I know in the past there was a, there was a couple of times, which my younger brother, he would make fun of me by saying, Oh yeah, but you're not a U.S. citizen. And, and that, that shit would piss me off. But it's like, bro, you, you have no idea the amount of shit I've had to go through because I don't have that piece of paper, man. So it's just, uh, yeah, I would, I, you know, that's just one of the big frustrations is, is people within your own community that were born here, uh, that are Mexicans that were, but are, are, you know, Chicanos that were born here and they don't understand how much, how good they have in having that citizenship. Uh, and you know, so that, that's one thing that's frustrated me when I've, whenever I've talked to people about, about the immigration process, um, or they'll, I don't, this has been weird. Like I've, I've legit told people before in the past, they're like, oh yeah, I have the green card, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll look at me sideways and they're like, but you're not illegal. Right. And it's like, dude, I literally just told you, you have a green card. I'm like, are you dumb or <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I was just going to throw that out there. That's kind of weird. Yeah. People it's, it's rough because, you know, I know some people, they, when they, if they tell you they're undocumented, you should like never tell anybody else that that person is not undocumented. Or that person is undocumented because you, you literally risk their lives. You know, simply yes. being deported. So yeah, that is you know I had a, 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 an episode recently about a uh, brother and sister that came um, to the desert and they lived undocumentedly. Uh, oh, I, I watched that. Oh my god, that was a really rough story, man. I, uh, I'm glad you did that episode. Yeah, I know them personally very well. 
So when <laughs> yeah. I when I first heard that story, I was just like, holy shit. This was like 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And I was like, oh my God. And I finally <laughs> they finally agreed to, you know, come together. Um, because I always, you know, hear the story like uh like you know, the sister would tell the story and then the brother would tell the story like months later. And I was like, I'll go back. I'm like, hey, your brother said this. They're like, oh yeah. I'm like, oh my god. Like it gets worse. <laughs> but people, people, it's, yeah. You, you want? What are your thoughts about that that episode? Just like the sheer amount of mental strength. I mean, physical strength and willpower to have just crossed the border for a better life. I mean, just it it, it was mind boggling for me to hear that account. I mean, I know, I know my um. I have family members that uh, they weren't as lucky as me. So the way I was brought here was uh, fake papers uh, for, from another kid. That was lucky because I was a baby. Uh, well, I was really young. But uh, to hear somebody like trekking through the desert, I know family members that have done that. Uh, they And they've talked a little bit about that. But that story was like really in detail. And I was like, wow, it's like, you know, that that deserves respect, that type of effort that deserves respect, like all that suffering just to be here for a better life. It just warrants a lot of respect. Uh, that that's one thing I, that's what I felt when I was just hearing it. I was like, man, I was, I was pretty speechless for a lot of it, to be honest. I was shocked when they told me that they were like children. Yeah. Crossing the desert. They're, they're teenagers, but you know, it still was like, fuck, scary as fuck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I've, I've, yeah. And like a lot of people die on that journey. A lot of people die. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's one thing that I, I'm glad they came on and I didn't have that experience, you know, um, of, of like crossing to the desert. I, I, I just crossed, I don't know how they crossed me, but I was like, a, I, mean, I was very young, you know? Yeah. So, uh, uh, but that was, super intense i mean me having army training i don't think i could have done that shit you know <laughs> it's just it's hard so um and can i also i want to move you know my last question I, I would do want to like uh, um talk about a little bit about you guys i want to ask marcus about uh your experiences of adoption if you want to talk about it you don't have to um because I know you talked about it a little bit on your podcast, how you know you were adopted and by I guess white people, right? Americans, and you have memories of coming to the U.S. and uh, like was or, or 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 were you too young for that? Yeah, so I uh, was adopted six months, so unfortunately, I don't. I have friends that that do have some somewhat faint memories, but for me not so much um after six months i came here um six months old yeah six months old okay yeah from so, peru right yeah from peru from lima peru that's where i came from um so yeah you know just growing up here uh in the united states i really uh assimilated quite uh when i say assimilated just transitioned into this culture uh, almost effortlessly because, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, there weren't any, well, there were Peruvian adoptees. There were some in my, my city. Um, but you know, I, I pretty much grew up the American lifestyle. Um, you know, I lived in a very you know, homogenous, you know, white community. Um, I will add that it wasn't diverse at all. Um, which probably had a pretty big effect on my upbringing. Um, but that being said, I never really went through too many difficult issues in my life. My life was not difficult at all. I would say I'm very fortunate for that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I wasn't, I was never exposed to anything else other than, you know, the, uh, I guess you could say the quote white American, you know, lifestyle, um, do I wish I would have grown up in a more like, I guess an area where maybe there are more people from South America. Uh, yeah, I guess it would have been, it would have been cool to, to meet others from different cultures and whatnot. But if my life were different, then perhaps I wouldn't be here right now. Um, you know, in this podcast with you guys, 
Um, so, you know, I, I'm thankful for my, my, you know, where I came from, but, um, yeah, people always, you know, like to wonder, like, or speculate, like what, where exactly I grew up and whatnot, but yeah, you know, growing up, uh, small town, <coughs> Illinois, um, is a, again, not, it's not, I wouldn't say mundane, but, you know, grew up playing sports, uh, working, um, you know, I really didn't go on this path until like, you know, after high school, um, well, more so I started to notice or take part and interest in my identity, but really, I guess more so like during my graduate school years and, and after, uh, was when I, I, it took a more like serious turn. Um, and then just like reading a lot of, uh, articles and like watching documentaries and whatnot about indigenous people. And then just like, you know, learning more about myself or as much as I could about myself, obviously, you know, there are limitations to that. Um, or maybe there aren't at all. It's quite a difficult path uh, for an adoptee, I will say. Um, <clears throat> I did want to add that, and that I didn't uh, answer you uh, because I, I think I didn't give myself enough time, was the negative parts of uh, the podcast or the experience. And I think that I, I would have liked to have add that, you know, as far as insults and like what people say, like it is what it is. Um, I don't think about it too much. I would say the thing is, I guess it's time and it's the expectations of where, you know, you want the channel to go. You know, Wancho and I have worked like really hard, but I always have really high expectations for it. And, you know, putting a lot of time in, you know, creating scripts, reaching out to people and like doing all this stuff, you know, in the end, it makes you wonder like, what will be, what will be the end? Well, I mean, you know, I love what I do with this channel, like with, with Manchalo, but like, what will be the other results that will come in the future? I'm more so of like a person that, that expects to see like results rather quickly. Um, so like when there's like progress in terms of like views and like people watching, and I know that's like a small like component to like what obviously I want <laughs> for the channel, because, you know, I, I want to reach out to a lot of people too. And like, you know, get more people's attention and like make connections. It's important, but I'm also kind of like a numbers person too. And I like to see things grow, especially things that I one and I put a lot of work into. Um, so I would say that's the, 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 I wouldn't say negative. I would say like somewhat negative because I'm, I'm putting a lot of like time, you know, personal time that, you know, we could be putting into something else, but I love what I do. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I want to see things grow faster, but it's also like having the patience for YouTube channel to grow it, it takes time but I'm, I'm very proud of like where one and i have came um so i guess that's i just wanted to add on that little point um <clears throat> but yeah going back to like the uh adoptee experience um it's rough because you know for a lot of adoptees i know they did grow up in, in lifestyles that were not so good so specifically those from south america um that grew up where, where you know a lot of parents shouldn't be parents specifically adoptive parents um i've heard a lot of really terrible stories um of you know parents picking favorites between adoptees um not listening to their kids when there's a serious issue that was affecting them um or just not paying attention at all you know um so i i view my my life as an adoptee is you know, somewhat you know, I don't want to say privilege, but yeah, I guess somewhat privileged because again, my life was not difficult. Um, so yeah, I'm very fortunate to be where I'm at right now, but you know, obviously for a lot of other adoptees, they would have different stories to tell you. Um, I have a question. Sure. So, you know, we're doing this Zoom meeting. And everybody has like a, a picture on, you know, on their profile and there's a picture of you with uh I'm guessing in Peru with llamas, right? Yeah. And so when was the first time you went to Peru and how can you, how you describe the experience, you know, and yeah. Yeah. So the first time I went back was the end of 2018. Um, after about 27, 26 years. I wish I would have made time to go back earlier. You know, I, I, I went to a lot of other countries before, and you know, I went to Georgia, I've been to China, Germany, and other places. 
Um, but I, I don't know why it took me so long. And I think that's maybe an issue with a lot of adoptees is uh, they don't start digging into their roots, uh, indigenous roots, I guess, even more so like their, you know, where they came from until a later age. Um, because uh, specifically for those that grew up in like the Midwest, we're so immersed in the American lifestyle. We don't give ourselves enough time to want to go back, trace back our roots or go back to where we came from and see what life was like. Um, so yeah, coming back to Peru was quite an interesting experience. Uh, you know, the first thing I saw when I came out of the airport was a giant tile, uh, tire pile that was burning, it was all on fire. <laughs> and you know in the u.s i believe when you know burning things is illegal um specifically giant piles of tire um <clears throat> so it it's hard because you know I, I i can't speak spanish fluently um yet so it was kind of an adjustment specifically i was uh you know i would go around and like order food and whatnot um but, you know, the lifestyle in Lima, obviously, is, is quite different than the United States. Um, people there, a lot of people there live by, you know, what they make. Um, being able to travel around is quite a luxury, I think. Um, people live by, again, like I said, it's by minimum, not minimum wage, but like by honest means. Um because, you know, here in the U.S., we, we make more than people in Peru, obviously, in other countries as well. Um, so it was, a, it was kind of, you know, a shock. I think it would have been a bigger shock if Peru would have been the first country I would have went to. Um, but I had been to like eight other countries before that. So I was prepared and I was like ready. Um, but it was different going to a country where, you know, most of the people, a lot of the people look like, you know, you. Me, I mean, um, <clears throat> but obviously you still felt like as an adoptee, you never fight, quite find your home um, when you, you go to your birth. I mean, at least for me and maybe other adoptees too, I think, uh, because I never felt at home, even when I was in Peru, um, you still almost feel like, you know, a stranger in, in a foreign land. Um, Maybe that's just because I don't have any connections to my biological family members at all. Um, I think I said this in the last video was that, you know, I was uh, dropped off at some person's like house uh, as a baby. And then I was, you know, picked up and like taken to the authorities. Um, and that's all the information that is being given. Um, that's all I have. Um, so that's why, again, I don't have any connections to any family members at all biological family members, so to speak. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, life there, it's, it's an interesting, you know, lifestyle. There's a lot of, obviously it's a country of about 34 or 33 million people, or maybe 30. Um, and the indigenous roots are obviously quite present there. Um, but again, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's, still difficult for a lot of people um you know because you've got the corruption like most countries in south america there's issues with corruption presidents and whatnot um people struggling to to live um so yeah it was it was a different experience i will say but you know i managed to go to cusco um that picture that you see was taken in machu picchu i, I had the time to go there um and just see what life was like um, in Cusco as well, going to other cities in Peru. Um, so yeah, I, I'm fortunate that I was able to go. Um, recently I was in, I went through Belize and Guatemala and Mexico, and that was also in, in quite an experience too. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I would recommend people to go specifically those that are, are adoptees from Peru too. It's important to go back to, see what life would have been like if you were to have grown up in the country that you were adopted from. Thank you. Uh, yes. Really yeah. a lot of good words, you know, in the experience. I, I, I hear you, I heard your story slightly here and there. And I think, um, you know, everybody has a journey and your journey is, you know, very unique and, uh, 
Yeah, I, I I did like the words that you said about what's the end goal for the the, the podcast. You know, your podcast. Um, I think I think the same Thank thing you. too because, um, you know, we these things are going to exist after we pass. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like our kids are going to hear it or great grandkids. It's not like, you know, like, like uh, you know, uh, we can't hear the voices of people from like 200 years ago that didn't leave stuff behind. Obviously audio, right? But now generations from now, we're going to have people listening to us, our actual voices or sometimes video or whatever, or pictures. And um, they will be able to, I guess, have more insight into what we, how we feel or, or think. And he's really careful as why, <laughs> you know, what we say online is very important. And we don't do stupid shit or say stupid shit or like fight with each other. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you guys reached out uh, when I got that death threat. And I think, um, you know, it's important that we just talk to each other and, and you know, and hear each other out. I can, you know, safely say that I have like no negative feeling for either of you. Um, and, I, I, and, you know, the death threat stuff happens to a lot of natives that speak about these issues. And it's such a shitty thing to ha have happen, you know, and I was, um, you know, just hearing people's stories about it, you know, their experiences. And, I, and I've been hearing it for like, over 20 years now that people's experience some people that wouldn't even come on the podcast because of the stuff they already experienced and they don't want to add to it and they have really good stories to say they're really good perspectives and insight on stuff and it just sucks that they are scared of repercussions you know and that shouldn't happen so uh, i'm grateful that we're having this conversation even though you know I'm sick and Marcus is sick, you know, but it's, I hope people are listening that just, you know, like, you know, we, this internet culture is fucking dumb. It's just so bad out there. But before we, uh, we end the, uh, the recording, does you guys have any, anything to say? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, I completely agree. I'm really happy we were able to sit down and, and have this conversation. I think it'll be hopefully a very good pr uh, precedent for people to um, talk to others, you know, even if they don't agree, like, you know, you can talk about these issues and learn from each other um, and just be civil. I mean, there's no need to have an online beef. There's no need to be fighting. There's no need for any of this stuff. And, um, you know, me, me and Marcus have learned over this last year, you know, it's unfortunate that we had that beef with you, but you know, that's in the past. And I'm really glad that we did this episode. I think this will be, uh, good and a probably a welcome surprise because nobody even though we were doing this episode with you so it'll, it'll be pretty good to see what yeah, I didn't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I, I yeah people were asking me because I I made a little post like oh man people are gonna get shocked on after Saturday you know who I who I had had on want to have on my podcast they were like who I was like don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, no, it, it was good. It was good having this conversation with you. So uh, I'm really, really grateful. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm really fortunate that we were able, you know, to have this video, you know, break. I, I watched a lot of your podcasts and whatnot. Usually when I, when we, you know, so-called enemies are like, you know, not having a lot of views <laughs> with other people. I watch a lot of their stuff and I try to understand them the best as I can, where they come from. And I watch a lot of your videos, man. I'm going to say your music uh, is pretty catchy. <laughs> oh, that's from a friend. I, I stopped. I stopped using that because uh, everything gets flagged for copyright infringement. Even though I have a document that says I can use <clears throat> my friend's music, I, I know him personally. I grew up with him, right? And um, and he's on Spotify, right? But then, like, I, my all my videos constantly get tagged for copyright infringement. I'm like, bro, like, oh my god, I have I have permission to oh, use that music, so now I'm not even using the music because I'm like. Um, you know, my daughter makes music and, and I might use her stuff in the future. So, uh, yeah, watch out for that, you know? But yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. But one of the, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I, I like Tony. Yeah, uh, I like his music and uh, I think he's, 
really talented and I, I you know he's a good dude you know and yeah but yeah same with you know you guys and you know same thing with me you know like I somebody came to you said you know you know go go to that guy Rick right there he's a fucking asshole people did it to me too you know and, and I think um just this chill out a little bit you know and just yeah just, just talk yeah I'm sorry I'm choking you my with my with my uh burps right now I'm burping like crazy um, oh you're good. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah you're fine <laughs> I'm just gonna say like yeah I was watching you know, your videos and whatnot and you know I agreed with you know things that you were saying and I was like thinking to myself in the summertime I was like it's too bad things you know have to be this way and then you know I saw your tweet and I was just like man like no one deserves like you know get those sort of you know death threats and whatnot and I was like well I also want him to know that you know Wanchelo and I would never like do things you know like that so you know I sent you that message and uh, I'm glad we were able to have this video and you know being able to establish you know these ties and um, yeah just thank you for having us on yeah and that's a, that's really hard because I'm, I'll tell you that people posting my real name, posting pictures of me online, and, and, and on my address is just like the most. It's scary because I have kids, you know, and yeah. uh, I don't want my kids to get hurt, and I don't want anybody in my family. So uh, that has happened to me before, and I am like, grateful too. You know, did you check out any of those movies I sent you? So there's some movies. Oh, you know, I actually was going to, there was one that I had meant to like start on. It was the one, uh, what was it called? Damn. I haven't yet, but I, I definitely had planned to now that I've like got my travels out of the way. I actually was in Dubai. I just got back. Oh, that's nice. Um, so I, I was really like planning for that because I have other things that were meant to go on and it didn't happen. So now I finally like have free time to like pretty much watch things. So now um, I was going to make some time to, to watch what you sent me. But I did watch the video about the um, oh, was it sovereignty? So that's what I was I was referring oh, to earlier yeah. in the podcast. Okay. So I was like, you know, thank you a lot. But um, no, I meant to get onto the other videos that you sent me too. Yeah, yeah we cool. we should we should make a reaction video to the uh, video on sovereignty. That that'd be pretty neat. I think the one from the the, the sick one tribe. That one they talk about that one. Yeah, you sent a video. It was like ten oh, minutes yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we've done reaction videos. Maybe we should do that one on that one that'd be yeah. useful to that's a good video i like that video yeah i'll post it for anybody listening i'll post it on on facebook i usually post it like once a year i try not to post the same shit over and over you know but yeah it's a good video i, I will repost it so people listening thank you for for coming on if, if, if you heard it on on that uh, this podcast the comment buffalo or if you heard it from indigenous podcast you know i hope that you know you hear all these complexities and understand that we're always going to be learning never stop learning so thank you